So recently in the media, we have heard quite a lot regarding Lucy Letby, the individual, and the crimes that she has now been convicted of. But what we haven't heard is Lucy Letby's version of events. So in this video, what I'm going to take you through is Lucy Letby's cross-examination in court. This was Lucy Letby taking the stand for the first time, where she was giving evidence to her defence barrister, Benjamin Myers KC. Becoming tearful, Letby says her job was her life. She said to have that taken away, my whole world just stopped. She says the situation has progressively got worse. Mr Myers asks, how hard is it to be what you're accused of? Lucy Letby replies, it's very difficult. Since November 2020, Letby says she has been remanded in prison. Mr Myers asks Letby about her being arrested for the first time. Letby says this was nothing like she had ever experienced before. Wiping away tears, Letby says there was a knocking on the door at 6am from police at her Westbourne Road Chester home. At the time, her father was with her. They had no idea at all the police were coming that day. She said, quote, They told me I was being arrested for multiple counts of murder. They put me into handcuffs and took me away. After three days of police interviews, Letby was released on bail. She says she was not allowed to return to her Chester home and went to live with her parents in Hereford. Becoming tearful, she says the second arrest in 2019 was a mirror image of the first arrest. It was the most scariest thing I've ever been through. It just traumatised me. Mr Myers asks if the trauma has left Letby sensitive to certain things. Letby replies she is now sensitive to noises and is easily startled by new things. She says she has been diagnosed in prison by a psychologist with PTSD. She says the journey to and from court from prison is about an hour and a half each way. Letby has been at court each day throughout the trial. She says she usually returns to prison at 7pm from court. Mr Myers asks about the notes. Letby says about her notes, quote, It's something I have done my whole life. She adds she has difficulties throwing things away, and that includes notes. Mr Myers asks about one of the notes she had written. Letby says she does not have a precise date of when she had written it, between July 2016 and July 2018. The note is headlined, not good enough. Letby says she had written, quote, I haven't done anything wrong, because she hadn't done anything wrong. She said where it states, quote, worst case scenario, the police would get involved. Where it states slander and discrimination, she says that was how she felt the trust was towards her in regard to the allegations. Where it states, I am an awful person, let be said at the time she did feel an awful person as she was worried she had made many mistakes. She said she was being taken away from the job she loved for things she had not done. In regard to the note and where it states, I'll never have children or marry, she says, my whole situation felt helpless at times. In regard to the note and where it states, hate and hate myself for what this has, at the time I did hate myself, she says. She says she was made to feel incompetent in some way. She says her mental health at the time of writing this note was poor. She says it was difficult with the isolation I felt and this lasted two years. In regard to where it states on the note, I killed them on purpose because I am not good enough to care for them, I am a horrible, evil person, asked what she means by that, Letby responds, I felt as though I hadn't been good enough, and in some way I had failed in my duties, my competencies. That was insinuated to me. In regard to I am evil, I did this, she said, quote, I felt at the time if I had done something wrong, I must have been an awful person. Letby says she feared she may have been incompetent, and because of that, she had harmed those babies. She adds she could not understand why this happened to me. She says, looking back, she was really struggling at the time of writing the note. Mr Meyer says he will go through the background material for Letby first, then talk through the cases involving the babies. Letby is asked about the Countess of Chester Hospital and working there. She says her first placement on the neonatal unit was in 2010. As a full-time qualified nurse, her first work there was in January 2012. At that time, she was qualified to care for special care and high-dependency babies, 
predominantly in nursery rooms three and four. Asked about how much she valued her nursing work, she said, quote, Massively. It was everything. I always strive to go on every course to be the best I could. Let me add she completed a mentorship course so when students came in, she could be their sole mentor at work. She qualified as a mentor fairly early on, probably in 2012. She says she really enjoyed that aspect. Mr. Meyer says for two of the babies in the case, there was a student being monitored under Lucy Letby's supervision and guidance. Letby says it would depend on their training stage, but it would be under her direct supervision. Letby obtained her QIS qualification, allowing her to look after intensive care babies, following a university module, which included a placement at Liverpool Women's Hospital involving hands-on clinical experience. The six-month course concluded in March or April 2015. During a typical shift, Letby explains, there would be two band six nurses on duty, plus one band five nurse with QIS training. Letby says there would be a lot of intensive care babies on the unit, and Letby would be looking after them, having had the experience of looking after babies in a level three centre at Liverpool. The court has previously heard the Countess of Chester Hospital neonatal unit was a level two. Letby says she was very flexible and had been on hospital overnight accommodation prior to getting her house. She said she did enjoy the intensive care side and she made other nurses aware that that was her main preference and where she was most happy. She denies saying other areas of her work in non-intensive care areas on the unit were boring. She does not recall ever having an argument with anyone about where she should be working. Mr. Myers asks about the electronic system nurses use to take notes, which would be inputted on terminals in the unit. One would be in room one, Letby explains, the others would be outside the rooms. Each staff had specific logging details to input notes. Mr. Myers asks about the notes being made retrospectively, usually at the end of a shift and can cover a period of several hours. Letby says to remember what had happened through the course of a shift for a baby, her retrospective notes to be documented would be compiled from a mixture of documentation at the time and notes she had written on the back of her handover sheet. Mr Myers asks about an example for one of Child I, a note written by Letby at 8.43am at the end of Letby's shift. Letby explains she would have made notes on paper prior to writing them on the terminal, as a retrospective note at the end of her shift. Let me explain there are nursing notes and family communication notes which are separate. The former are clinical ones, the latter specifically for family. Asked about the notes, Let me says ideally they would be disposed of at the end of the shift in the confidential waste bin. Let me says she would normally store the handover sheets in her pocket and as a result would take them home. The court has previously heard several handover notes were found at Letby's home at the time of her arrest. Asked about the timings of the notes made, Letby says they would be accurate as they could be, and the prescriptions would be accurate to the minute. The nursing notes would be approximations. Mr Myers refers to an observation chart for child O, with observations for heart rate, temperature and respirations. Letby explains how the readings would be taken. The routine observations would take a couple of minutes. Letby adds that for each observation, ideally it would be signed off with the nurse's initials. In the reality of a busy shift, it happens to everybody that an initial signature could be occasionally left off the bottom of the observation chart. The chart shown does not have initial signatures for three of the readings. One is from a student nurse. Asked if that would indicate something sinister, Letby says it would not. A second chart is shown, where there is a gap at 4am on the observation readings for the signature initials. None of the signatures are Letby's. Asked if there is anything sinister or strange about this, Letby says it is not. Mr Myers repeats this for an intensive care chart. Letby says there is nothing sinister about a lack of signature for one of the readings. Mr Myers refers to an intensive care chart for child Q. The final set of observations at midnight has no initial signature. The signatures can be missed from time to time, the court hears. Mr Myers asked about feeding babies at the neonatal unit. Lucy Letby explains the process of administering milk, saying you would aspirate the NG tube first and testing the acidity of the contents of the stomach. 
Asked if that process is done every time, Letby responds, no. The process of feeding a couple of milliliters would take only a few minutes. For larger babies, it would again be done by gravity feeding, but a dose of 40 mils as an example would take 10 to 15 minutes. The process would be via 10 mil syringes, so the baby would be fed 10 mils at a time. As a lot of babies were premature, the process of feeding would take longer, and for a 40 mil bottle feed, the process would take about half an hour. Mr. Myers asks about blood gas tests for babies. A blood gas test result for child Q is shown to the court. Lucy Letby explains the process on how a blood gas test is obtained, causing a prick onto the heel and getting the blood sample into a very small tube. A second member of staff would run the sample through a machine outside of the nursery rooms to obtain the result. She said, quote, It would normally usually be a different member of staff, as the first nurse would stay with the baby to check the bleeding stops. The blood gas machine would be down the corridor from room one. Occasionally, if the machine was broken, an alternative machine on the labour ward would be used. Mr Myers refers to the neonatal review for child B. This was a document compiled by police which compiled which nursing staff did what for each baby. They include dates and times for observations, prescriptions and feeds. Lucy Letby says the times are approximate to the nearest quarter of an hour, such as weaning change. A note at 9.30pm of a feed given and an observation would be an approximate time for both. The court hears it is not a precision time for both, as those are two separate activities carried out by the same nurse. Asked about the time between these charts, Lucy Letby explains nursing staff would be busy elsewhere, communicating with families, responding to alarms and other duties, in addition to set tasks as designated by the shift leader. The chart goes into the times of which nursing staff carried out what for child B up to the point of child B's collapse. Mr Myers refers to prescriptions for child B. Lucy Letby explains two nurses would be required for the signatures and prescriptions. Mr Myers asks about June 2015 to June 2016. Letby says the time was much busier than previous years. We seem to have babies with a lot more complex needs. Letby says staffing levels were not changed to accommodate for this. Letby says they had not encountered a baby on that unit before with chest drain requirements or stomas or haemophilia as they did during June 2015 to June 2016. Letby says she would quite often do more shifts as overtime after being asked to do so than her typical monthly quota. She says, quote, At times it could be very short notice, sometimes from lunchtime and being asked to cover that night. She says she would not know in advance which baby she would be caring for. Mr Myers asks if it's possible to ask for a particular baby to care for. Letby says it's possible, usually to facilitate continuity of care. Between June 2015 to June 2016, Letby was generally well and did not have any days off sick. Mr Myers now refers to the babies in the case, asking general questions. He asks about when there is a death on the unit. Letby says the death does have an impact on everyone on the unit, as it was a small unit. Everyone would have a different reaction to it. She says there would be nothing formal as a means of support to deal with such instances, but there would be support among the colleagues. Messages would be exchanged among staff. There was no form of support and no formal structured assistance the court hears. Moving to a day shift in 2016 did not help, Letby says, and Mr Myers says she continued to work nights anyway. Lucy Letby says staff had to be professional and carry on in caring for the babies who were on the unit. For families, support on offer would come from nurses who had a bereavement guideline. Largely, it would be from the nurses, Letby states. We would normally support them as much as we possibly can. The bereavement checklist was formal guidance, and that would include collecting memories for the families. It would normally be the designated nurse for that baby to compile such memories, Letby explains. A checklist is shown for child A. Lucy Letby's signature is present on the entries. She was the designated nurse. The checklist includes, quote, hand and footprints, lock of hair taken, having religious support, taking photos, baby dressed in own clothes. 
The note includes a memory box, which would, let be tells the court, be a box donated by neonatal charities and be a storage box for the hand footprints, a lock of hair and a teddy bear, one for the baby and one for the family to keep. A staff debrief would be held, not always, and led by the consultant following the death of a baby on the unit. All staff would be invited to attend. It could be held days or weeks following the baby's death. Letby is asked about activities outside of work. She says she had quite an active social life, attending salsa classes, going on holiday with friends and going to the gym. She would meet friends after work. She lists five colleagues, four of them nurses and one doctor, as people she would meet socially. They were only form of support I had really, says Letby. She is asked about the doctor. He started in 2015 as a registrar, Letby explains. They started knowing each other through work, then would meet socially. Letby says she and other staff would regularly use their phones when at work. The general rule would be not to use phones in clinical areas. Anywhere outside of the nurseries was acceptable, the court hears. Letby is asked about how well staff could get to know families. Letby says those families could be there for several months. She agrees she would also get to know families of babies not on the indictment. She says she would not be the only nurse to keep in touch with families after they had been discharged. She agrees she had looked for parents on Facebook. Mr Myers asks about her Facebook usage. I was always on my phone, replies Letby. Letby says she would look up many names out of curiosity, such as colleagues, people she had met at the saucer. They would be people who were just on my mind. She agrees she also looked up names of parents on Facebook for babies not named in the indictment. An agreed piece of evidence is now shown to the court. It is titled Facebook Searches by Lucy Letby, June 2015 to June 2016. The searches include the ones previously referred to in court, searching for the parents of babies' names in the indictment, plus on those same days, the Facebook searches for other babies' parents' names, work colleagues and social and non-work related matters. As an example, on June 9, 2015, in addition to a search for the mother's name of child A and child B, let be carried out searches for free social contacts to staffing colleagues Ashley Hudson and David Harkness and the name of a mother from a child from Liverpool Women's Hospital neonatal unit. Letby says for various searches they were, quote, people on my mind at that moment. The social names would be the ones she had met at Saucer, school friends, people she had met socially. The total number of Facebook searches made by Lucy Letby in June 2015 was 113. In July 2015, the total number of Facebook searches was 70. In August 2015, it was 175. And the number of searches in September 2015 is 209. Mr Myers is asking further questions about Facebook searches carried out by Lucy Letby. Asked why she would carry out a search for one of her nursing colleagues she regularly worked with, Letby replies it was someone who would have been on her mind. The total number of Facebook searches in October 2015 is 173. One of the days, November 5th, 2015, there are nine searches in nine minutes. Most are social and two are the names of mothers of children in the Liverpool Women's Hospital neonatal unit. Letby says it would not be unusual for her to make several searches in a few minutes on somebody on Facebook. That would be normal for me, she said. The total number of searches in November 2015 is 277. Five of those related to parents of children in the indictment. The total number of searches in December 2015 is 211. In January 2016 it's 199. In February it's 178. Mr Myers states, generally speaking, would your pattern of searches be consistent across the month? Letby replies, yes. The number of Facebook searches in May 2016 is 164, and it's 233 for June 2016. For the latter month, none feature any searches for the names of parents of babies in the indictment. Letby denies there is any sinister reason why she should be looking up the names of parents of babies. Letby adds she was always on her phone in her spare time. The focus turns to the case of Child A, born on June 7th, 2015, twin of Child B. Child A died the following day. 
Mr. Myers is retelling the notes for Child A's birth. Child A, a baby boy, was born with antiphospholipid syndrome and he died the following day. Mr. Myers refers to nursing notes, referring to the UVC line being in the wrong position on June 8th for Child A. It was reinserted but was still in the wrong position. A long line was then inserted. Care was handed over to Lucy Letby at 8pm. Mr. Myers refers to retrospective nursing notes written by Lucy Letby on the morning of June 9th. The notes include, quote, Instructed line not to be used by registrar, child A, noted to be jittery, was due to have blood gas and blood sugar taken. At 2020, child A's hands and feet were noted to be white, centrally pale and poor perfusion. Child A became apneic, reg in the nursery, child A making nil respiratory effort, child A later died. Lucy Letby says that around the time of this taking place, she had moved to Ash House in June 2015. She said she was, quote, still in the process of moving and unpacking at the time of Child A's events. She said she had received a text message that morning asking her to work that night shift. A text message from Yvonne Griffiths at 9.21am on June 8th, 2015 is shown to the court asking Lucy Letby to work that night. Lucy tells the court she was, quote, frequently asked to come in and cover neonatal unit shifts at short notice, saying she was very flexible. Let B tells the court the first she knew she was going to be caring for child A in nursery room one was when she arrived for the handover at 7.30pm. She recalls there was a lot of activity in the nursery, with Dr David Harkness doing a line procedure and nurse Melanie Taylor sorting fluids for child A. She explained child A had been without fluids for a few hours. An intensive care chart is shown for child A. After 4pm on June the 9th, the cannula tissued, which meant child A's fluids had stopped, the court is told. A clinical note is shown to the court about the UVC and long line insertions. Letby says she was told by Dr Harkness and Nurse Taylor the long line was suitable for use to administer 10% glucose. A collective handover had taken place prior to Letby arriving at the nursery, lasting about 20 minutes. Letby tells the court when fluids are administered via a long line, one of the two nurses present has to be sterilised, and in this case that was nurse Melanie Taylor, handling the bag, cleaning the long line, attaching the bag to the long line port on child A's left arm, and making sure the line was flushed. Letby was, she says, the quote, dirty nurse, i.e. unsterilised for this procedure. Letby says she turned her attention to hanging the bag onto the drip stand cot side and programming the pump. Letby says the usual practice is for the line to be flushed with sodium chloride prior to fluid administration. She says she did not observe if that took place. The 10% dextrose solution is shown from a fluid prescription chart as beginning at 8.05pm. Letby says Melanie Taylor went over to a computer to start writing up notes. Letby said she was doing some checks on cotside equipment, suction points and emergency equipment. She says Dr Harkness at this point was doing a procedure on Twin B at this point. Letby says she observed child A to be jittery. Letby says jittery was an abnormal finding for child A. It was an involuntary jerking of the limbs. She says she remembered it was noticeable. Child A's monitor sounded and his colour changed. Letby says the alarm sounded, but she did not know what it indicated at the time. She says she noted Child A's hands and feet were white. She went over to Child A, who was not breathing, so they went to Neopuff him. Letby and Nurse Taylor disconnected the 10% dextrose on Dr Harkness's advice. Referring to centrally pale, Letby says that refers to Child A being pale in the abdomen and torso. Child A was apneic, not breathing. Nurse Caroline Bennion was also in nursery room one and had been during handover, the court hears. Letby says she began the usual procedure of administering Neopuff to Child A. Child A's heart stopped and a crash call was put out. Letby says this is an emergency line for doctors to arrive urgently. Dr Ravi Jayram arrived immediately and another nurse arrived shortly afterwards. 
Lepi says she cannot recall the resuscitation efforts and says it was an unexpected huge shock, saying she had just gone through the doors and then this was happening. Child A died shortly before 9pm. Letby says she, as designated nurse, arranged hand and footprints for Child A as part of the hospital's bereavement checklist. A nursing colleague helped assist in the hand and footprints as that was a two-staff procedure. A baptism was offered to Child A during resuscitation and Child A and Child B were baptised together. The court hears this was part of the practice. Letby said she felt after child A, the bag of fluids and the long line should be retained. She says she labelled the bag as, at the time, we should be checking everything in relation to the line and fluids, as it could be tested afterwards. She says she did not know what happened to the bag afterwards. Letby said in reaction to child A's death, she was stunned, in complete shock. It felt like we had walked through the door into this awful situation. That was the first time I met Child A and Child A's parents. A nursing colleague messaged Letby on June 9th, praising her for how she handled the situation with Child A. You did fab. Letby responded, Appreciate you saying that and thanks for letting me do it and supporting me so well. Letby says the network of support among colleagues in messaging each other outside of work was, quote, something we all did. Mr Myers asked why Letby searched for the mum of child A on June the 9th at 9.58am. Letby says it was just curiosity that she wanted to see the people behind that awful event and the parents were on my mind. She says it was a pattern of behaviour she had as she searched a name as part of a quick succession of name searches in a short period of time. Letby says there was a debrief after Child A had died a few days later, led by Dr J-Ram, which discussed if there was anything to learn from the event. Letby said it was more clinically based rather than emotional support. She said the event affected her emotionally and denies causing Child A any deliberate harm. Letby says of that night, quote, You never forget something like that. Mr Myers turns to the case of Child B, Child A's twin sister. Child B was born on June 7th, 2015. Mr Myers says Child B was born with antiphospholipid syndrome as noted on a clinical note. Mr Myers notes that at birth, Child B was blue and floppy, poor tone, HR approximately 50. Resuscitation efforts were required with a series of inflation breaths, intubation was successful after a couple of attempts and Child B stabilised on the evening of June 7th. Mr Myers refers to nursing notes written retrospectively on the morning of June 10th. Child B had desaturated to 75% shortly before midnight, with Child B's CPAP prongs pushed out of nose. Quote, prongs and head reposition. Took a little while and O2 to recover, HR remained stable. Half past midnight, sudden desaturation to 50%. Cyanosed in appearance, centrally shut down, limp, apneic, CMV via Neopuff commenced and chest movement seen. Became bradycardiac to 80s, successfully intonated and HR improved quickly. 0.9% saline bolus given and colour started to improve almost as quickly as it had deteriorated. Started to breathe for self. Lucy Letby says she does not have much recollection of the night shift for June 9th to June 10th in respect of child B. A diagram shows Letby was in nursery room 3 for that night shift, looking after two babies. Letby says without that diagram she would not have recalled who was doing what that night. Mr Myers asks how Letby would know if a nurse needed assistance in a non-emergency situation. Letby says they would come and ask. Letby says CPAP prongs can be dislodged very easily and it happened frequently in babies. Shortly before 12.30am, Letby says she believed she carried out a blood gas test on child B at around 12.15am. A fluid chart is shown to the court. She says at 10pm on June the 9th, lipids were administered. A blood gas chart is shown with a reading at 12.16am with Lucy Letby's signature initials. She says it was usual practice that two nurses would be involved in the blood gas test and she says she had no other involvement with child B in the run-up to her deterioration. Let B is asked about a morphine bolus administered to child B as referred to in police interviews. 
Mr. Myers says to be clear about the timing of this morphine bolus, a prescription is shown to the court, with the time started being 1.10am. The court hears this is 40 minutes after the collapse. Letby says she cannot recall with any clarity events in the build-up to Child B's collapse. She says she knows there was a deterioration fairly soon after the blood gas test. She said both she and the nursing colleague were in Nursery 1 when Child B's colour changed, becoming quite mottled, dark all over. She says the nursing colleague alerted her to the deterioration. Letby is asked if she had seen that mottling before. Letby said it was not unusual, but it was a concern, in light of Child A's death the night before. Child A was pale, but Child B had purple mottling. She said she and the nursing colleague were joined by a doctor at that point. Letby said she was asked to get the unit camera from the manager's office to take a picture of the mottling. She says on her return, Child B had stabilised and returned to normal colouring, and there was no mottling to photograph. She said she had the camera with her and she had returned to the nursery very quickly. Letby says she believes she administered some of the prescribed drugs for child B after the collapse. A blood gas test taken at 12.51am is signed by Letby. She says as it is a two-nurse procedure, the signature does not indicate whether that was also the nurse who took the initial blood sample. Letby says following child B's collapse, other doctors came to the nursery room but she cannot recall who. She says presumably the designated nurse would have communicated with the family following the collapse. An observation chart shows Letby took observations for child B at 1am. She says this was not unusual for nurses to do this, especially if the designated nurse was busy elsewhere. The court hears this could be if that designated nurse is speaking with the parents. Mr Myers now turns to the case of Child C, a baby boy born on June 10th, 2015, weighing 800 grams at 30 weeks plus one day gestation. An event happened on June the 12th where Child C's stomach was distended, Mr Myers explains. Child C collapsed after a projectile vomit. Resuscitation efforts commenced, but he died on the morning of June 14th. A note by nurse Sophie Ellis is shown to the court made retrospectively after Child C died on June 14th. The note provides observations for Child C from the night shift. It adds, quote, First feed of 0.5 mils given at 2300. At around 2315, Child C had an apneic episode with prolonged Brady and DSAT. Crash call resuscitation commenced. Resus drugs given care handed over to senior nurse Mel Taylor. Further notes written retrospectively by Sophie Ellis on June 16th, quote, had two fleeting braddies, self-correcting, not needing any intervention. Nurse Melanie Taylor's notes, written retrospectively, state, call to help baby as baby had braddy desat. When arrived to baby, baby apneic, loss of colour, neopuff but not able to bag, no chest movement. Medical team crashed bleeped. No heart rate heard. Started chest compressions. Intermittent gasping. Continued resus. Intubated. Good chest movement and air entry. Continued chest compressions. Emergency drugs administered as documented. Resuscitation efforts continued. Child C was later baptised and died that morning on June the 14th. An X-ray examination of Child C on June 12th showed marked gaseous distension of the stomach and proximal small bowel. Let be confirms, as shown from her work shift pattern displayed to the court, she was not in work that day. She worked night shifts on June 8th, 9th, 9th, 10th, 13th, 14th, and 14th, 15th. Let be had messaged Yvonne Griffiths if there was any spare shifts going on June 11th. The response was the unit was okay for staffing levels through the week, but may get busier at the weekend. Let be responded, quote, Think I need to throw myself back in on SAT. Asked to explain that message, Let be says she wanted to get back into the unit looking after babies. That was what I was taught at Liverpool Women's after a difficult shift to get back in and carry on. Mr Myers refers to police interviews with Letby regarding Child C. Letby told police she was involved from her memory in resuscitation efforts. She told police she thought she did chest compressions. Letby tells the court she has no recollection of any of the events leading up to Child C's collapse. 
She says it was a quote, normal shift and has no memory of what happened until child C's collapse, which was a significant event. She says she has looked after hundreds of babies. A shift rotor is shown to the court, showing Letby was looking after two babies that night on June 13th. She tells the court she was in nursery room 3 with child C in room 1 that night. A timeline of staff duties from the neonatal unit is shown to the court for June 13th, 14th. Lucy Letby is recorded as carrying out observations for the two babies she was the designated nurse for in room 3, plus an entry made on a fluid balance chart for one of those two babies. Mr Myers asks how long those would have taken. Letby says one of those would have taken minutes, the other procedure would have taken a little longer. Child C's event is listed at 11.15pm. Letby says her duties were allocated for two babies in room 3. Among her duties, as shown on the timeline chart, are signing for medication for babies in that room between 10.08 and 10.21pm, making nursing notes regarding grunting for one of the babies at 10pm and making observations. She says she became aware of child C at the time of his collapse and her being called to help. Prior to that, she says she was not aware of his events and was not in room 1. She says she was called over by nurse Sophie Ellis and asked her to put out a crash call. Melanie Taylor was in the nursery when I arrived in room 1 with child C. He was apneic and needed respiratory support. Another nurse was present in the nursery at the time. Sophie Ellis put out the crash call. Letby says she was involved in chest compressions as part of resuscitation efforts. Letby is asked why she can now confirm she was in room 3 of the nursery, having not been able to remember that in police interview. Letby says she was able to remember being in nursery room 3 after since being made aware of which babies were in room 3 that night. Letby says she can recall alarms going off but not standing cotside or saying anything regarding child C's observations to Sophie Ellis. She says she was said to have been in room 1 based on the statement by Sophie Ellis, but she tells the court she had not been in that room prior to child C's collapse. She says she had been put in that room 1 based on Sophie Ellis's statement. Letby tells the court she has no recollection of being there. She says she suggested explanations to police in interview of what she was doing in room 1 based on the statement, not on her independent recollection. Letby says her memory of that night was, I believe I had been called to help Child C following his collapse. She says she had assumed what police had told her in interview to be true based on Sophie Ellis's statement. Messages between Letby and colleague Jennifer Jones Key are shown to the court, in which her colleague says, quote, you need a break from full-on ITU. You have to let it go or it will eat you up. I know it's not easy and will take time. Letby had initially messaged her about wanting to be in room 1, but a colleague had said no. Nurse Jones Key replied she agreed with the colleague. Letby is asked, following a disagreement between her and Nurse Jones Key at 11.05pm, whether those messages had led to her taking any action on Child C minutes later. Letby denies that was the case. Mr Myers asks, do those messages have anything to do with child C? Letby replies, not at all. Letby says she would have been aware of child C's family during resuscitation efforts and that was the first time she had seen them. Asked why she had searched for the parents on Facebook, Letby says they were on her mind. She adds, quote, when you go home, you don't forget about the babies you cared for. She says about what the parents had gone through, it's unimaginable. Mr Myers is now referring to the case of Child D, a baby girl born on June 20th, 2015, weighing 3.13 kilograms. The mother's waters had broken several hours earlier. Notes show Child D, quote, 12 min's age, in dad's arms, lost colour, floppy, 5 rescue breaths plus 2 min's IPPV, reviewed by SHO on arrival, good resp effort. Child D started grunting in theatre and the midwife was not happy with Child D's colour. Child D later stabilised and had been transferred to the neonatal unit. Child D suffered three collapses on the morning of June 22nd, the court is told. The last of those at 3.45am. Child D later died at 4.25am. Mr Myers refers to police interviews with Letby in which she said she did not recall Child D. 
The nursing rota for the night shift of June 21st is shown to the court, in which Letby was on duty in room 1, designated nurse for two babies. Nurse Caroline Oakley was the designated nurse for child D in room 1 that night. Mr Myers refers to child D's mother's statement, in which she said a conversation was had with Letby at 7pm, and also saw Letby at the point child D collapsed, quote, hovering around, not doing much, holding a clipboard. Letby says she does not recall a 7pm conversation. She said she would not have been on duty in the clinical nurseries at that time, and would have arrived after 7pm for work, then going on to the nursery. Swipe data for Letby is shown at the entrance to the maternity neonatal entrance doors at 7.26pm. Letby says that would be to prepare for her shift. A text message is sent from Letby's phone at 7.15pm where she says, quote, I'm just about to leave for a night shift, so no problem. Hope all okay. Letby says she would have been in Ash House at the time she sent the message. Nursing notes by Kate Bissell for Child D are inputted into the system, the last of those at 7.45pm. Observations for Child D are shown to the court, which do not have Letby's initials on them. Letby denies she was in the nursery unit at 7pm. Nursing notes by Caroline Oakley are now shown for Child D, written retrospectively on June 22nd. 01.30, call to nursery by Nurse and Letby. Child D had desaturated to 70s. The notes add Child D also desaturated to 70s at 3am and 3.45am. For the latter, stimulation given to no effect, bagging via Neopuff at 3.52am. SHO on unit and call to help. Dr Crash called and resus commenced. Lucy Letby says she has no recollection of the first event or the build-up to it. A timeline of nursing duties is shown for June 22nd from midnight. Letby is shown as one of two nurses for an infusion at 1.25am with Caroline Oakley. Letby says she has no recollection of this event. She says that night she would have been caring for babies on room 1 and helping other nurses along with other miscellaneous duties. A timeline shows Lucy Letby and Caroline Oakley are checking medication for child D at 2.18 and 2.39am and had started an infusion at 2.40. The order of the signatures did not have any indication on who administered the infusion, Letby tells the court. At 2.44am, Letby and Caroline Oakley give medication to child D. Letby says she does not recall any details for the 3am entry on a fluid chart for child D. An infusion for child D is made by Letby and Caroline Oakley at 3.20am. Mr Myers says there is nothing recorded on the timeline for Letby's involvement in respect of child D between 3.20 and 3.45am. Letby says she has no memory of the events leading up to child D's collapse at 3.45am. Letby says she cannot recall what happened to child D. Mr Myers moves on to the cases of twin boys, child E and child F. The twins were born on July the 29th, 2015. On the evening of August the 3rd, child E bled from his mouth, Mr Myers tells the court. Child E died in the early hours of August 4th. Mr Myers reads out nursing notes made by Letby, which include... Prior to 2100 feed, 16 mil, mucky, slightly bile-stained aspirate obtained and discarded. Abdo soft, not distended. SHO informed to emit feed. Child E declined through the night after vomiting blood. Resus happened at 1.15am and child E bled from the mouth. In family communication, mummy was present at the start of shift to attend cares aware that we had obtained blood from this NG tube and we were starting some different medications to treat this. The nurse Lucy Letby will continue to give evidence today on the case of child F. Benjamin Myers Casey, on behalf of Letby's defence, tells the court, Child F had low blood glucose levels throughout the day on August 5th, 2015 and had a blood test which, when analysed, showed Child F had returned a very high insulin measurement of 4,657, also a very low C-peptide level of less than 169. A chart is shown for Child F's blood glucose readings on August 5th, which were 0.8 at 1.54am and remained low throughout the day. 
the highest being 2.9 at 5am, but most readings were below 2. A neonatal nutrition prescription chart is shown to the court, which shows Lucy Letby signed for a lipid infusion on August 1st, the infusion starting at 12.20am on August 2nd. Lucy Letby tells the court it lasted just under 24 hours, being taken down at 12.10am on August 3rd. There was already a TPN bag in place on August 2nd, the court hears, as shown by the chart. It was a continuing 48-hour bag. Midnight was around the time which fluids were changed. Letby has signed for a TPN bag on August 3rd with a co-signer. The new bag is on the chart beginning at 12.10am. TPN bags last 48 hours and lipid infusions last 24. A further sheet is shown for August 3rd to 4th, 2015. The continuing 48-hour bag is signed for but is not a new TPN bag, the court is told. That bag was discontinued at 12.25am on August 5th. The chart shows a crossed-out prescription for August 5th for a TPN bag where there is no lipid infusion. Let B tells the court Child F had been on milk. Something changed with those requirements and the second prescription was made for a TPN bag with lipids to be administered. The new TPN bag was hung up at 12.25am on August 5th. The bag was the same, the lipid requirements had changed which meant a new prescription was written up. Two nurses were involved in hanging up the new TPN bag the court hears. Let B is one of the two nurses who signed for it. Two nurses, neither of them let be, are involved in a new lipid infusion. Mr Myers asks if there is anything let be did which accounted for child F's drop in blood sugar at that point. Let be replies, no. A prescription chart is shown to the court, showing child F received a free meal 10% dextrose bolus at 2.05am. Child F's blood sugar had risen by 2.55am the court hears. Another free meal 10% dextrose bolus is given at 4.20am and Child F's blood sugar level rose. Mr Meyer says Letby's night shift would have ended as usual. A chart is shown for a new TPN bag and lipid infusion for Child F at noon on August 5th, which Letby confirms would have been after her shift ended. The TPN bag was hung up and a new long line was inserted as it had been tissuing. Letby says if tissuing happens, it is standard practice to stop the administration, discard everything and start again with a new bag, as the TPN bag would have been sterile. Mr Myers says even after that, Child F's blood sugar levels remained low throughout the day. Mr Myers says this is not the same TPN bag Letby had hung up just after midnight, and Letby confirms this. Mr Myers asks why let be searched for the mother of child E and F nine times on Facebook between August 2015 and August 2016 and the father on one occasion. Let be replies, searching people on Facebook is something I would do. Searching for child E and F's mum would be when she was on my mind. That was a normal pattern of behaviour for me. Asked why let be had taken a picture of a thank you card written by the family of child E and F, let be replies, it was something I wanted to remember. I quite often take photos of cards I receive. Letby said she took a photo of the card at 3.40am one morning in the nursing station while she was at work. She says there was nothing unusual about that. Mr Myers now turns to the case of Child G, a baby girl born on May the 31st 2015 at 23 weeks plus 6 days gestation, weighing 1 pound 2 ounces at Arrow Park. The court hears Child G was cared for in the early part of her life at Arrow Park before being transferred to the Countess on August 13th. The events are on September 7th, 2015, involving Child G projectile vomiting and having a desaturation. She was transferred to Arrow Park between September 8th to 16th, returning to the Countess. Two projectile vomits, a self-resolving apnea and a desaturation for Child G take place on September the 21st. The second instance, a desaturation, also took place on the same day. Lucy Letby says she was called for help in this incident. Child G's monitor was off. Letby says she recalls Child G at the time. She said, quote, She stood out as a baby who had complex needs and was a very premature baby. We all got to know Child G and her family quite well. She says she would have cared for Child G many times during her time at the Countess of Chester Hospital. 
A shift rotor for September 6th to 7th is shown. Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for a baby in room 1. Child G was in room 2 being looked after by another nurse. Letby says she was in room 1 with colleague Elsa Simpson shortly before Child G vomited. She said, quote, My memory is Elsa and myself were sat at the nursing station. We had been there for a few minutes. We heard Child G's monitor alarm going off and heard a retching sound. We both immediately went in there and found Child G vomiting and struggling to breathe. No one else was in the nursery room, Letby tells the court. Nursing notes by the designated nurse for Child G, written retrospectively, are shown to the court. They include, quote, Abdomen full but soft with no discoloration, aspirates minimal, partially digested milk, short period of straining uncomfortable at start of night when having cuddles with dad. Lucy let be taken over care following vomit apneic episode at 0200. A feeding chart is shown for 45 ml of breast milk at 2am via the nasogastric tube. An acidity test showed pH 4 for child G. Mr Myers asks if the chart showed the stomach had been aspirated prior to the feed. Letby replies, no. Lucy Letby's notes for 2am onwards state, Child G had large projectile milky vomits at 2.15, continued to vomit, 45 mils of milk obtained from NG tube with air. Abdomen noted to be distended and discoloured. Colour improved a few minutes after aspirating tube, remained distended but soft. Letby says she has no memory of and had not been asked to do the caring for child G prior to this incident. A nursing duties chart for the neonatal unit on September the 7th is shown to the court. Letby's first entries are recorded at 2am, carrying out observations and giving a feed for the room 1 designated baby. A process which would take a matter of minutes, Letby tells the court. She says she was then with Ayla Simpson for a few minutes. The court hears at 2am, Letby's nursing colleague had administered the feed for child G as recorded in her nursing note. Quote, Nurse L. Letby taken over care following vomit apneic episode after 2am feed. At the time of the event, child G was seen vomiting from her mouth and nose and struggling to breathe. Letby says she observed this on her arrival. Child G's abdomen was quite firm and distended and red. Letby says room 2 would always have lighting on as a high dependency unit needed to have lights on to be safe to observe babies. She said, quote, We were both quite shocked. We could see vomit on the chair and on the floor. We were both quite shocked by that. Letby adds that babies don't vomit like that and it wasn't something she had seen before. A crash call was put out. Letby says the vomit on September the 21st was a forceful vomit, but not as significant as the one on September 7th. Letby tells the court Child G needed further breathing support and Child G was intubated later that morning. Letby says she recalled Child G had further desaturations and required intubation, but the problems with oxygen saturation continued. She says she confirmed giving care to Child G. She improved after being reintubated. Mr Myers asks Letby about the September 21st events for Child G. The first is at around 10am, the second after 3.15pm. For that day shift, the court is shown the rotor, and Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for Child G that day in room 4, along with two other babies. Two of the three members of the management team were on an office-based day, the court hears. Lucy Letby was also responsible for a fourth baby rooming in with parents, which was, the court hears, a baby staying in on-site accommodation with their parents as the family prepared to go home. Letby said she would periodically be going to that accommodation to check things were okay and answer any questions parents may have. Letby's notes for that day are shown to the court. They include, quote, at 10.15, two large projectile milky vomits, brief self-resolving apnea and desaturation to 35% with colour loss. NG tube aspirated, 30 mils undigested milk discarded, abdomen distended, soft. Doctors asked to review. Temperature remains low. Tachycardic, 18 beats per minute since vomit. Mum states that child G does not appear as well as she did yesterday. The court is shown a feeding chart for child G. A 40 ml feed of expressed breast milk was given at 9.15am, signed by Letby. After the feed, there were two projectile milky vomits, Letby noted. 
Chao Ji also had a large bowel motion. Letby says she would have tested the stomach pH level prior to a feed, but would not have aspirated the contents. She says that would not have been needed as Child G was a 40-week baby and would be treated as a full-term baby by this stage. Mr Myers asked if it would be known how much milk would be in a baby's stomach. Letby says she would not, as there would only be an aspiration to check for the pH levels. This projectile vomit did not leave the cot space, Letby tells the court. She says that would have amounted to 10 mils. Letby says she cannot be sure, but believes Child G's mother would have been present at the time. Letby says she, herself, would have been in the room but not at the cot side of Child G when the vomit happened, and would have been alerted to it by the monitor going off. She says Child G stabilised after that. Letby said she asked if Child G could be seen sooner than usual on the ward round, as room 4 would normally be the last to be seen. Letby says there was no large-scale medical response to the incident. Letby explains care was transferred to another nurse as it was identified Child G required a higher level of care, and Letby was already looking after three babies that day. The court hears evidence about the second incident on September 21st. Letby says parents would be allowed in on the units around 3pm that day. Letby says for this instant she remembers being conscious there were other parents in the room. Screens were put up as normal practice for privacy as Child G was having cannulation following her event. The note records, quote, numerous failed attempts then at cannulation finally inserted by Dr Gibbs, without fluid for six hours as nil by mouth. Blood sugars were stable throughout, further significant apnea Brady desat following cannulation requiring Neopuff and 100% oxygen. Help summoned. Letby says she discovered the desaturation and called for help. She said Child G had been behind the screen for some time and had been looking after her other designated babies. She says she was aware the cannulation process took some time but was not present to see it taking place as it was behind the screens. A long line chart is shown to the court, which noted the cannula was inserted at the seventh attempt. Letby said she cannot recall why she went in, but saw behind the screen that she was alone. She was dusky and blue and was not breathing. The monitor was not on. Letby says Child G was on the procedure trolley used for procedures such as cannulation. Letby says the baby should not have been left alone on the trolley like that. She says she picked up Chao Ji and put her back in her cot, applied Neopuff and called for help. Letby says she did not know why the monitor was off. The nurse colleague, quote, froze and got someone else to help. Another nurse, Caroline Bennion, came in. Letby said she was very concerned about three issues. A baby being unattended on a procedure trolley, alone behind screens and with a monitor switched off. Letby said she raised those concerns with a nursing colleague and was keen to file a Datix report. The nursing colleague was less keen, Letby says, to raise the issue as the procedure had been carried out by Dr Gibbs. Letby said she took assurances that issues would have been dealt with as discussed. Lucy Letby confirms she continued to care for Child G after that day. The case now moves to Child H, a baby girl born on September 22, 2015, weighing 2.33 kilograms. The court hears Child H did not receive surfactant, a protein which helps the lungs, until 41 hours after her birth. Child H required free chest drains and had a number of desaturations in her first few days. At 3.22am on September 26th, Child H had a profound desaturation to 30%. The following morning, Child H had another desaturation to the 40s at 12.55am on September 27th. Letby tells the court she remembers Child H and her care needs, but not specific details without referring to the notes. She says for September 2015, the unit was busy at the time. A message from Letby on September 24th referred to staffing levels on the unit as being completely unsafe, the court is told. In a message to another colleague, Sophie Ellis, Letby says, quote, Oh, Soph, it was pretty bad. 18 babies intubating on handover and a baby with a sugar of 0.1! Exclamation mark. Letby tells the court the capacity was 16 on the unit. Mr Myers says, had the unit always been this busy? 
No, let be replies. Let be said it had been getting increasingly busier. She adds she had never seen a baby with chest drains at the Countess until child age. She adds she had never seen a baby with three chest drains even at a tertiary centre. The most I had seen was two. Let be said during this time, doctors had to quote, look things up and discussions were held on how to manage the chest drains. She says from her experience, chest drains were suited into the skin so they didn't move. Very few chest drains were kept on the unit. Arrow Park couriered out some drains, let be tells the court. A nursing handover sheet for September 23rd, 2015, recovered from Letby's home in the Morrison's bag, is shown to the court. Letby is asked why she had that sheet, and four others with child H on it. She replied, It has just come back with me inadvertently and was left at home. They have not been taken out of my pocket at the end of the shift, and I may have taken them home. Mr. Meyer says, Did you mean to take them home? Letby replies, No. Let be add she did not know she had that many handover sheets at her house. Quote, I did not keep track of them. The nursing notes by Let be for September 25th to 26th are shown to the court. They include, quote, two chest drains in situ at start of shift, intermittently swinging, serous fluid accumulating. 23.30, bradycardia and desaturation requiring Neopuff in 100% to recover. 10 mil air aspirated from chest drain following poor blood gas and 100% oxygen requirement. Consultant Gibbs attended the unit and inserted a third chest drain, all three drains swinging. Child H, desaturating on handling, minimal handling observed when possible. At 3.22, profound desaturation and colour loss to 30%, good chest movement and air entry, colour change on CO2 detector, Neopuff commenced, serous fluid from all three drains became bradycardiac, doctors crash called and resus commenced. Let be is asked about the chest drains swinging. She says that shows they are working, with fluid moving back and forth to drain as needed. Serose fluid is naturally occurring fluid in the body. For September 25th to 26th, child H was the only baby in room 1 and Let be was a designated nurse that night. She required two nurses on a high level of care and Letby had a colleague to assist her with the drugs for child H and maintenance of the chest drains. Letby refers to a note, quote, at 0200 blood transfusion completed, saying the timing of that is an error and should be 3am. A blood transfusion chart shows the transfusion started at 3pm on September 25th and ended at 3.05am on September 26th. The note is co-signed by Letby. A separate chart with Letby's handwriting shows, quote, chest drain 0210 and a bolus 0250. The blood complete is sometime after 3am prior to 3.24am, Letby tells the court. Letby says the 2am note error she made was nothing sinister and just a mistake and other accessible notes showed the timing the blood transfusion for child H stopped at 3am. A message from Yvonne Griffiths, part of the management team to Letby, is shown to the court, in which she commends Letby for her hard work over the previous shifts. The message is on September 26th. She adds, quote, You composed yourself very well during a stressful situation, and it was good to see her confidence grow. Letby relayed that message to a colleague. Letby said this message exchange had followed a disagreement over baptism for child H. Yvonne Griffiths had felt it was, quote, not appropriate for that time of night, as child H had stabilised at that point and the shift was busy. Further messages between Letby and her colleague are exchanged. Letby says, for context, she was, quote, choosing not to have child H due to lack of appropriate support, as she wanted extra staff to assist her in the care of child H, as child H had several chest drains for which she had not been familiar with. Let be's response to Yvonne Griffiths, Thank you, that's really nice to hear, as I gather you are aware of some of the not-so-positive comments that have been made recently regarding my role, which I have found quite upsetting. Our job is a pleasure to do, and just hope I do my best for the babies and their family. Let be tells the court there had been frustration about comments made by colleagues that Let be and another nurse were being allocated room one shifts on the rotors, and there was frustration about the unit being busy. 
For the night of September 26th, 27th, Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for two babies in room two. Nurse Christopher Booth was the designated nurse for child G in room two, and Nurse Shelley Tomlins was the designated nurse for child H in room one. The court is shown Nurse Tomlins' note for that shift, which include, quote, Around 2030, child H had profound DSAT and Brady. Air entry no longer heard and capnography negative, therefore ETT removed and doctors crash bleeped. New ETT cited on second attempt. This event is something the court hears Letby is not being blamed for. 21.45, desaturation to 40% despite good air entry and positive capnography. ETT suction quickly with thick bloodstain secretions noted. Child H recovered quickly after. This was also not an event Letby was blamed for, Mr Myers tells the court. The notes continue. 0055, profound desaturation to 40% despite equal bilateral air entry and positive capnography. ET suction yielded nil secretions. Child H then went bradycardic at 0107 to 40 beats per minute and required chest compressions and adrenaline at 0108. Saline bolus given at 0112. Letby is asked if she had any involvement with this event. Letby replies, no. The notes continue. 0330, profound desaturation to 60s, again requiring neopuffing with no known cause for DSAT. Copious amounts of secretions yielded orally, pink tinged. Small amount of ET secretions gained, again pink tinged. Heart rate mainly normal during DSAT, recovered slowly. Let me is asked if she had any awareness of any of the events, including at 0055, the event Letby is being blamed for by the prosecution. Letby replies, no. A neonatal review chart is shown to the court, showing nurses' responsibilities and duties throughout the night of September 26th to 27th. Lucy Letby confirms from the chart she was involved in the administration of medicine and the sodium chloride flush with Shelley Tomlins on Child H at 10.12pm. This was recorded on the computer the following minute at 10.13pm. The flush was a normal procedure following the administration of such medicine the court hears. The next recorded involvement Letby has with Child H is at 10.38pm. Letby tells the court that was for a morphine infusion. That was recorded on the computer at 10.39pm. The next recorded involvement on the neonatal chart for Letby is at midnight, when Letby is making an observation for a different baby. Letby says she was not near child H at this time. Letby confirms to Mr Myers the next involvement with child H on the chart is from 3.41am with the administration of prescriptions. She does not recall what those would have been for. Mr Myers moves on to the case of Child I, a baby girl born on August 7th, 2015 at Liverpool Women's Hospital at a gestational age of 27 weeks. She was transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital on August 18th. Active problems noted by Dr Sally Ogden at the time of the transfer included preterm respiratory distress syndrome, establishing feeds, jaundice, suspected sepsis. September 5th to 6th, 2015, saw a number of events where child eye deteriorated and she was transferred to Liverpool. Mr Meyer says Letby is not being blamed for those events. Child eye was transferred back to the Countess later that month and on September the 30th at 4pm, child eye had vomiting, brady, apnea and desaturation, followed by a similar event later that day. Another event happened on October 13th with child eye deteriorating. The following morning, child eye deteriorated again and required resuscitation. She was transferred to Arrow Park on October 15th before returning to the Countess on October 17th. Child eye had a desaturation on October 22nd and died the following morning. Lebby is asked if she had a recollection of child eye. Lebby says she does. She said she was a baby with us for many months and we got to know her and the family really well. She had complex problems which required frequent transfer to Liverpool. Child eye's abdomen was always more distended than normal and there were occasions when that distension would increase, Letby tells the court. 
Lebby confirms to Mr Meyer she looked after child I on many occasions. A radiograph from August 23, 2015 is shown to the court. Mr Myers says this had been part of what experts classed as a quote, suspicious event, with a clinical note at the time recording non-specific gaseous distension of the abdomen, which is suggestive of NEC in child I. A record of Letby's work shifts shows Letby was not in work that day. Letby says she was looking after child I and two other babies in room 3 on her long day shift on September 30th. She says she has some memory of that day, but not great detail. She denies doing anything to cause either of child I's events that day. She says at 7.30pm during the handover, she was giving the handover when child I became apneic. Neopuffing was given and it was noticed the abdomen was distended. An NG tube was inserted and air was aspirated. Let B reads her notes from that day, including a note that Child Eye's mum had noticed the abdomen seemed more distended than yesterday and Child Eye had an ongoing low temperature. For the abdomen, it was, quote, soft to touch and the bowels had been opened. The 1500 Doctor's Review noted Child Eye's abdomen was distended and she appeared mottled in colour. Let be said she asked for the review upon seeing Child Eye's mottled appearance. At 1600, Child Eye was fed, and at 1630, Child Eye had a large vomit and desaturation. Doctors were crash called, and Child Eye was transferred to room 1. Let be said for the 4:30 p.m. event, she was not at Child Eye's cot side, but she was in the room. She says, quote, "She had vomited, and I went over to her and needed neopuffing briefly." Child eye was placed on an incubator, a cannula was inserted but tissued, quote, colour appears pale but improved. There had been no further vomits, the abdomen still appeared distended. Child eye had, quote, self-correcting desaturations to 80s, which let me says was not a case when the alarm would be needed. Quote, you have to give the baby time to see if they self-correct, which most babies do in 30 seconds to a minute. In this case, Letby says Child Eye was self-recovering without the need for help. Letby says she could not say definitively whether Child Eye's mum had left at the time of the handover. Letby's notes add, quote, At 19.30, Child Eye became apneic, abdomen distended plus plus and firm. Bradycardia and desaturation followed. SHO in attendance and registrar crash called. Air plus plus aspirated. Lebby says the air was aspirated after the Neopuff device was used. Bernadette Butterworth's nursing note states, During handover, child eye abdo had become more distended and hard, she had become apneic and bradycardic, and sats had dropped. IPPV given, and despite a good seal with Neopuff, there was still no chest movement. Aspirated NGT, air plus plus plus, and two mils of milk obtained eventually got chest movement and sats and heart rate normalised. Letby says she recalls Child Eye recovered well afterwards. Text messages are shown to the court from colleague Jennifer Jones Key to Lucy Letby, in which she complains a colleague had repeatedly in the unit commended Letby for her ability to swap shifts. Letby had replied in the messages saying it was nice to hear as there had been some not so positive comments about her. Letby added, everyone is tired on the unit. Letby tells the court the not-so-positive comments refer to her being on room one shifts when others felt that they needed the experience. She agrees with Mr Myers everyone had been busy on the unit. The messages are shown to the court. Jennifer Jones Key. Oh, it's just colleague annoyed everybody last night as she was going on about how amazing you were doing so many swaps and how naughty you weren't taken off today. Letby. Oh, was she? Kinda nice to hear something positive though, as being a few not so nice comments. Jennifer Jones Key. It wasn't for us, and F people off. I've done loads of swaps and extras. It was more the fifth time she said it. Let be. Everyone's pulling their weight. I think it's just sticking up for me because I've had some rubbish said about me. Jennifer Jones Key. No, she's sticking up for her friends and winding everybody else up. Shouldn't have said anything. Let be. I can't speak for colleague and I wasn't there. We've all been working hard. That's half the problem. Everyone's tired. Mr Myers now refers to the next events for Child I. 
Nursing notes by Ashley Hudson on October the 13th are shown to the court. They include, quote, pale, pink in colour, but well perfused. 0322. When in the nursery, neonatal nurse Lucy Letby noticed that child eye looked quite pale. When turning the light on for closer examination, we found child eye to be very pale in colour and not moving. Apnea alarm in situ had not sounded. Breathing was shallow and RR appeared low. Monitoring commenced. 30% Neopuff O2 commenced. Chest compressions commenced at 0325. No heart rate heard. Lucy Letby's note states the following. Written for care given from 0345. Child eye noted to be pale in cot by myself at 0320. Nurse Hudson present. Apnea alarm in situ and had not sounded. Full resuscitation commenced as documented in medical notes. A nursing shift rotor is shown for October 12th to 13th with Lucy Letby in room 1, designated nurse for one baby. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for three babies in room two, including child G and child I. Letby says she cannot recall looking after child I prior to 3.20am. She recalls going with Ashley Hudson to room two together and noticing child I looked pale. Lucy Letby states, Ashley was doing something on the worktop with her back to the cot. I was in the doorway talking to Ashley. Mr Myers. What was the illumination level like? Letby replies, I can see clearly enough that child eye was pale in the cot. Child eye was in front of a window. At no point is any nursery in complete darkness. The only time we have that is in room four for babies preparing to go home. It's important we need to see them visually. We need to see the monitors and the babies themselves. Letby adds, the colour level of a baby is one of the most important things we assess. I could see her face and her hands. She just looked very pale. I said to Ashley, she looked very pale, and we turned the lights up. Letby says she cannot recall if the light had been on a dimmer switch, but the lighting was turned up. Child eye was, quote, very unwell, so care was given. Letby says she cannot recall definitively whether she had turned up the lights before or after seeing child eye. The court hears in police interview, Letby had said she had told them the lights were turned on before. A subsequent police interview had Letby saying she did not know whether it was before or after seeing Child Eye that the lights were turned up. I know what I saw, Letby tells the court. The court hears further from the police interview. The officer asks if Letby remembered exactly the sequence of events. Letby said she did not, quote, I thought we put the lights on when we went in the room. Let be added in interview, maybe I spotted something Ashley wasn't able to. Let be tells the court child eye was, quote, in my direct eye line when she was at the doorway. The court is shown photographs of the lighting level in room two. The photos were taken in August 2020 and form part of the agreed facts. Do you recall the room being as dark as this appears to be? Letby replies, no. Would you ever have a high dependency unit as dark as this? No. Why not? Letby tells the court it would not be safe. Mr Myers asks if it was necessary to turn the lights up afterwards. Letby says it was as it was necessary for the care of child eye, such as the use of syringes. Mr Myers now moves on to the event for child eye for October 13th and 14th. Lucy Letby was a designated nurse for child eye in room one, with Joanne Williams designated nurse for two other babies in the same room. Mr Myers. Was there anything you did to make child eye feel unwell on any shift? Letby replies, no. Letby's notes from the shift at the beginning, quote, Aspirate obtained, abdomen appears full but soft. Some bruising, discoloration evident on sternum and right side of chest from chest compressions. Child eye, pale in colour. Letby says the bruising appeared to have come from CPR the previous morning. Further notes, quote, Child eye tolerating handling better. Tone appears improved. Remains pale. Abdomen distended, but soft. At 0500 hours, abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance, with area of discoloration spreading on the right-hand side. Veins more prominent. Oxygen requirement began to increase, colour became pale, 
gradually requiring 100% oxygen. Blood gases poor as charted. Chest movements reduced, continue to decline. Reintubated at approximately 0700. Initially responded well, abdomen firm and sitended, overall colour pale. Letby says she cannot recall this sequence of events from the morning. Shelley Tomlin's notes state the following. 0730 to present. Care of child I taken over, arrived on NNU minutes before arrest. Child I had just been retubed when DSAT Brady occurred and full resuscitation was required to bring her back. Child I stable on ventilator, abdomen very large, pale and veiny. Area of discoloration noted on right side of abdomen. Let me recalls there was discoloration, but not specific details. She says she was not involved in the continued care of child eye and denies having caused anything which allowed this to happen. Mr Myers moves on to the events of child eye on October 22nd and 23rd. Lucy Letby is a designated nurse for a baby in nursery room 2 and one in room 3. Ashley Hudson is the designated nurse for child eye in room 1 and one other baby. Lebby says she does not have much independent recollection from that night. She says her memory begins from when child eye was being resuscitated. She was alerted to child eye being unsettled at some point, but cannot recall during the night when that was. Child eye was, quote, rooting and appeared hungry, sucking on fingers and lip smacking. Child eye had been nil by mouth for a period of time, but Letby cannot recall how long that was for. Ashley Hudson's notes for that shift are read in court. Child eye was unsettled and rooting at start of shift, settled with dummy and containment holding. Long line removed due to constant occlusions. Neonatal Lucy Letby unable to flush. 2357, child eye was very unsettled due to hunger and was rooting. Child eye did not improve with increased Neopuff oxygen requirements and saturation and heart rate dropped. A crash call was put out by midnight and child eye was intubated. Child eye was later extubated as she was working against the ventilator. The neonatal schedule chart is shown to the court for October 22nd, which Mr Myers says does not record Lucy Letby having any involvement with child eye. Letby says she recalls seeing child eye and seeing she was upset, but was not sure at which time that was. Letby says she cannot recall where she was prior to the 1.06am event when Child Eye became unsettled again. Benjamin Myers KC, for Letby's defence, asks her if she was involved in the efforts to assist Child Eye after 1.06am. She confirms she was. She recalls going to see Child Eye at one point and helping nurse Ashley Hudson settle her, but does not recall at what point that was. She recalls being present when Child Eye died and recalls the parents being there. She says it was the first time Ashley Hudson had experienced a loss as designated nurse, and Letby says she assisted her in the bereavement procedure for the parents. The funeral for Child Eye was on November 10th, 2015. Letby says more than two members of staff attended that funeral. She tells the court she was not at the funeral as she was working. Letby's work shift rota is shown to the court for November showing Letby was working a series of nights on November 9th, 10th, 10th, 11th and 11th, 12th. Letby said she was advised by other members of staff to send a card to the family, which would be passed to them at the funeral. Letby's sympathy card is shown to the court. She said she gave it to one of the nurses who was going to the funeral. She tells the court she took a photo while at work. She said it was, quote, normal behaviour for her to take a photo of the card. A photo of another card written by Lucy Letby is shown to the court of her congratulating her close friend on the birth of her daughter. Letby says she would regularly take photos of cards that she would send and had done so for many years. She says she would also take photos of cards she would receive. Mr Myers moves on to the case of Child J, a baby girl born on October 31st, 2015 at 32 weeks plus 2 days gestation at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Mr Myers says there were a number of problems in pregnancy 
and child J was diagnosed with a necrotic and perforated bowel, NEC, and required transfer to Alderhey for a stoma to be fitted. Child J returned to the Countess of Chester Hospital on November the 10th. Mr Myers refers to the events on the night shift of November 26th, 27th. Mr Myers says Child J had desaturations at 4.40am and 5.03am on November 27th. The designated nurse for Child J that night was Nicola Dennison. Child J had further low desaturations at 6.56am and 7.24am with, quote, eyes deviated to the left, stiff arms and clenched fists. Lepi tells the court she had, quote, very little experience with stomas, having seen a couple at Liverpool Women's Hospital during training. Other staff at the neonatal unit had no relevant recent experience of stomas, Lepi adds, saying stoma surgery would only be carried out at a tertiary centre such as Alderhey. Asked if Countess staff would regularly handle babies with stomas, Lepi replied, no, I don't recall anybody being overly confident. She adds Child J's parents, quote, took the lead as they had the relevant experience from what they had been told at Alderhey. Lepi messaged a friend on November 19th, quote, It's shocking, really, that they are willing to take the responsibility for things that they have no training or experience on, etc. Don't think they appreciate the potential difficulties. Asked what she means by they, Lepi says the band for nurses. Mr Myers asks who would ask them to do it. Lepi says it would be up to the shift leader to allocate them. Asked why they would be asked to look after a baby with a stoma, Lepi tells the court the unit was so busy at the time. Lepi messaged the same friend on November the 25th, quote, Went to Las Iguanas, was really nice, at Salsa. Had three missed calls, they don't know how to give immunoglobulin, and I was the last person to give, so just phoned and told them. Nurse said it's mad, Ravi is there. What a nightmare it's all getting. They'll have to send babies out, question mark, question mark. Lebby tells the court it was mad busy on the unit and the staff numbers were not at the level required for the number of babies on the unit. The night shift rota for November the 26th, 27th is put up. Two band four unit nurses are named in the rota. Child J was in room four. The designated nurse was Nicola Dennison, a band 4 nurse also looking after one other baby in room 4. Letby was the designated nurse for two babies in room 3 that night. Letby tells the court she had no involvement in child J prior to her first desaturation. A rotor of the end of the shift is shown to the court, with Letby having taken on a new arrival to the unit as their designated nurse during the night. She said that night was, quote, very busy. Nicola Denenson's nursing notes are shown to the court. They include, quote, Shortly after the feed at 0400, child J became unwell and desaturated to the 30s. Initially not apneic, but then did require some neopuff to recover. Colour looks pale and mottled. A doctor records two profound desats, the first to 30s, the second to 50s. Both episodes required bagging, quote, since then pale and mottled. The apnea Brady Fit chart is shown to the court, recording two events at 4.40 and 5.03 a.m. The 4.40 a.m. event lasted three minutes, the second lasting two minutes. Mr. Myers, did you have any idea this was happening at the time? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked if she has recollection of the second pair of events. She replies, yes. She adds she has independent recollection of those events. She said for 6.56am she heard the monitor alarm in room 4 and child J was fitting. She wasn't breathing properly. Her eyes were rolling to one side of her head. We both heard the monitor and we, Letby and Yvonne Griffiths, went in. Let be said no one was in room 4 at the time the alarm first went off. Dr Gibbs arrived very quickly and child J was transferred to room 2. Let be says for the second event she was called to help but does not recall by who. Let be is recorded on the chart subsequently administering an infusion with Mary Griffiths. Let be says she stayed a little later on the unit that day for the end of her shift but cannot recall when that was. Letby tells the court she was unaware of the first pair of events for Child J that night, 
but was aware and involved in the care during the second pair of events. Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for child J the following night, November 27th and 28th, the court is shown. A nursing note for child J, written by Letby from that night, is shown to the court. Mr Myers. Any issues for child J from that night in your care? Letby replies, no. Letby messages a colleague about the shift of November 27th to 28th being, quote, much better. Mr Myers asks what she means by that. Letby replies the workload on the unit was much more manageable than the previous night. Mr Myers asks if a nicer, lighter workload would be what she wanted. Letby replies, yes. Would you want things to be going wrong? Letby replies, no. Would you want babies to be hurt? Letby again replies, no. Mr Myers moves on to the case of Child K. A baby girl born on February 17th, 2016, weighing 692 grams at 25 weeks gestation. Mr Myers says there are three parts to this event. 3.45 to 3.50 a.m. when a desaturation and a dislodged tube were noted, 6.10 to 6.15 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. Dr Ravi Jayram's notes are shown to the court. He records, quote, Initially dusky, floppy, no respiratory effort for child K at birth. Successfully intubated under 20 mins at third attempt by Dr Smith, transferred to NNU. For 3.50 a.m., quote, at 0350 hours, sudden deterioration, O2 sat dropped to under 40%, bagged via ET tube with Neopuff, poor chest movement. Tube removed and bagged via face mask, sats recovered quickly, reintubated. Nurse Joanne Williams records in nursing notes, quote, Approximately four to five minutes later began to desat to 80s. Dr. J. Ram in attendance and on examination, colour loss visible and no colour change on CO2 detector. ETT dislodged, removed and reintubated on second attempt. Large amount of blood stained oral secretions. A further note by Joanne Williams quote, Baby has had two further episodes of apnea and desaturation with colour loss, has been reintubated twice. Dr. J. Ram's note, written at 7.50 a.m., records, quote, At 6.15, began to have lower sats. Chew pulled back to 6 centimetres, sats dropped further, therefore extubated. Responded to bagging, re-intubated, settled for next 30 mins. 0.725, mean BP dropped to 14, sudden drop in sats, HR dropped to under 100. Cardiac compressions commenced for one minute. Tube noted to have slipped to 8 centimetres, withdrawn and heart rate picked up immediately. Child K was transferred to Alderhay later that day, but remained unwell and died on February 20th. Mr Myers asks if it was normal for a 25-week baby to be at a level 2 unit. Letby says it was not normal. Babies would usually be cared for at a tertiary centre. She says she does not know why Child K was at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The layout of the neonatal unit is shown to the courtroom for February 16th to 17th. Lucy Letby is the designated nurse for two babies in room 2 at the start of the shift. Child K was brought into room 1 during the night shift after her birth. Letby is asked if she has any independent recollection of Child K. She replies, I remember it was unusual seeing a 25-week gestation age baby and seeing her at some point but can't recall any of the contact. Letby said she would go into room 1 to collect medication and it was a frequently used room. Two babies were in room 1 with designated nurse Caroline Oakley. Mr Myers says there is a point alleged when Dr J Ram sees Letby by child K and child K's tube is dislodged. Mr Myers, did you interfere with child K's tube? Letby, no. Letby denies being at the cot side when Dr J Ram entered room 1 and says she does not recall any conversation with Dr J Ram that night. Mr Myers refers to a police interview with Letby from July 2018. Letby was asked if she remembered child K's deterioration. No was the answer. Letby said she recalled child K only as she was a 25-week baby, which was unusual on the unit. 
Letby was asked by police if she was present when Child K's ET tube dislodged. I don't remember, Letby said. Letby says she signed for morphine to be administered to Child K. She tells the court she had no involvement with Child K beyond that point. Letby says in police interview she was not by Child K's incubator at the time Dr Jram entered room 1. She told police if the desaturations dropped to 80s, she would expect the alarm to go off for Child K. She said to police, quote, I don't know why the alarm would not have sounded. Letby was asked by police if she had turned off or deactivated the sound on the monitor. Letby replied, no. Letby tells the court it does happen that a tube can move with an active baby. She told police, quote, tubes can slip if not properly attached. Letby says if she was there and had seen the observations drop and or the tubes slip, she would have summoned help. She denies being there at that point or having any involvement in the tube being dislodged or just watching. She denies Dr J Ram's report was accurate. The neonatal schedule for February 16th to 17th is shown to the court. Letby is involved in the care of her two designated babies up to 12.30 a.m., plus a baby in room 1 at 12.51 a.m., quote, assisting with cares. Let B cares for her designated babies up to 2 a.m. and assists in the medication of a fourth baby at 2.04 a.m. and 2.14 a.m. The chart shows Let B's records with her designated babies up to 3.30 a.m. when, at that time, observations are made and a feed given to one of the designated babies. Let B says... 3.30 a.m. would be a rough time of when it happened. The feed, observations and a nappy change could take half an hour. The quickest, 20 minutes, the longest, up to an hour. She says in this case, this would have taken 15 to 20 minutes. Letby is asked if by doing this, she had any reason to be in room 1 at that time. Letby says she would not have had a reason. Letby is then recorded on the neonatal schedule as caring for child K after the event has taken place. The first recorded activity is for morphine administration, with Joanne Williams signing for the medication and Letby being a co-signer. Letby says this was because Child K was being reintubated and required morphine. She does not recall being called to the nursery room. She does not recall being involved in the subsequent events for Child K. Letby is asked about a Facebook search for the surname of Child K made on April 20th, 2018 at 11.56pm. Letby says, quote, You still think of the patients you've cared for. She says she does not recall why she looked up the name at that point. Letby says that night was a busy shift, but asked whether she had done anything that night to merit questions about it years later, Letby replies, No. Mr Myers moves on to the cases of twins Child L and Child M, born on April 8, 2016, at 33 weeks and 2 days gestation. Letby confirms she is still working and caring for babies, working a mixture of day and night shifts at the hospital during this time. She says in reply to what her intentions were for the babies, to provide the best care possible. She estimates she cared for around 100 babies during these few months. Child L and Child M were born, with Child L later struggling with low blood sugar. A blood sample was taken for Child L. The insulin level read 1099, insulin C-peptide 264. The insulin was far higher than the C-peptide reading, indicating insulin had been administered to Child L. Child M later had a desaturation, which it is alleged Letby had caused. On April the 8th, Sophie Ellis, a colleague of Lucy Letby's, sent a text message, quote, How's the house, pal? Letby responds, Hey, it feels a bit weird having a whole house, but it's good, thanks. Although stuff everywhere has moved in properly on Tuesday and been at work Wednesday, Thursday and today. Doing tomorrow as an extra, so I'll see you tomorrow night. Won't be such an early start for you now back in Chester. The reply to Letby states, Yeah, I bet it does. It'll be more homely once you've sorted everything out. Geez, four long day shifts in a row. Are you okay? I know. I don't have to pay for petrol. It's cost a fortune. Yeah, they are. I haven't seen them for a while. What's the unit like? Letby replies, Yeah, I'll get there in time. Petrol and tunnel soon mounts up, doesn't it? Can you claim travel expenses? I couldn't for 4.05. Unit is busy. 
No one particularly unwell, just volume and people off sick. I prefer four days to four nights. At least tomorrow is an extra and Saturday pay. Oh, that'll be nice. Hope the weather's a bit better for you. Sophie Ellis replies, Yeah, we can. Oh my God, really? How come? That's seven weeks as well, isn't it? Yeah, four nights are awful. Oh, that's not too bad then. Think I'd prefer to keep busy. I think it's meant to rain. Damn it. Lucy Letby. Arian said something about the induction being paid for by the trust, whereas the 405 comes out of the network budget, so won't pay as it's an expected part of the role to progress, etc. Mad, really, and costs a bomb. We've got a nice mix of babies at the mo, really. Shift goes quick anyway. Ugh, oh, typical April showers, ha ha. Colleague is in Thailand and it's been 44 degrees today. Let me said it was a massive life moment for her to move into her new house and her main focus was on sorting out the house. Let me says the unit was still fairly busy at this point. On April the 11th, Let me messages a colleague, quote, the unit is in a dire way with staff. She says the unit had banker agency staff and band fives who did not have the ITU course. She says the unit being busy was often discussed by staff. Let me recalls being involved with the care of the twin boys and looked after one of the twins in the transfer to the neonatal unit. The twins were placed in nursery room one and let me cared for child L that first day. The following day, April 9th, child M was in a different place in room one following admission of other babies overnight. Child L and child M were in adjacent beds in room one, the court hears. Let me tells the court a baby's blood sugar levels are checked within the first hour of life. Child L's blood sugar reading is low at 1.9. The baby would be offered a milk feed via a bottle or NG tube and the blood sugar would be checked after another hour. This however did not happen with child L and he was administered 10% dextrose. Let me says this was outside the guidelines, a decision made by Dr. Bomick. Let me's note state advised by Dr. Bomick to commence 10% glucose. Let me added in the notes that she and the shift leader advised that this deviated from the usual policies. A glucose bag was hung up for child L. Let me said she cannot recall who hung up the bag. She said it would either have been herself or nurse Amy Davies. Child L had normal blood sugar levels the rest of the day. She tells the court she would have ended her shift at around 8pm. Mr Myers says for April 9th 2016 there are no recordings of blood sugar for 3am, 4am or 5am. A 10am reading of 1.9 is too low. It is 1.6 at noon, 2pm it is at 2. Let be had come on duty at 7.30am. The infusion rate has been changed at noon. A 10% dextrose bolus is administered at 3.40pm. Let me says she cannot recall who was involved in that administration. At 4pm, the blood sugar level is 1.5. At 4.30pm, a 12.5% dextrose bag is administered by two nurses, including Ashley Hudson. The readings remain low up to midnight. On April the 10th at 2am, the reading is 2.1. Then a new 15% glucose bag is administered. 4am it is 2.3, 6am 2.2 and at 2pm it is 3, an adequate level, but then drops for the rest of the day. A 15% glucose bag rate is changed early on April the 11th and a new bag is administered that day. The readings are 2.7, 2.9, 2.8 throughout that morning. At 3pm it is 3.5 and blood sugar is said to have stabilised. The infusion therapy prescription sheet is shown for child L, with prescriptions for April 8th and 9th. The first entry is for April 8th, 11am, for a 500ml 10% dextrose infusion via the IV line. Dr. Bomick authorised the prescription and the bag additive. Lucy Letby and Amy Davies set up the infusion. The first two infusion prescriptions have a line through them, as Lucy Letby explains, the rate of infusion has changed twice. It went from 4.2 mil per hour to 3.6 mil per hour to 4.4 mil per hour. The 4.4 mil per hour rate was started using the same bag at noon. The bags were stored in a cupboard in room 1. This was in a separate room from the insulin bags in a cupboard in a corridor. 
Mr Myers asks how commonly dextrose is used on the unit. Lepi says very commonly, adding that a 10% dextrose solution would be administered all the time. They would be used for generic use. Let B sent a message to her mother on April 8th, quote, Think I'm going to do tomorrow as an extra but go in a bit later. Extra money and Saturday pay. This was to be Letby's fourth long day shift in a row, April 6th to 9th, the maximum normally allowed for Countess staff at the unit the court hears. For the April 9th long day, Letby was designated nurse for two babies in room one and Mary Griffith was the designated nurse for child L and child M also in room one. Child L's 10% dextrose bag was changed on April 9th to a new 10% dextrose bag at noon signed by Letby and Mary Griffith. That bag would have come from the generic bags in room 1, Letby says. She does not recall who would have put it up for child L. The equipment involved in setting it up would have come from nursery room 1. Mr Myers says prior to this, child L had a blood glucose reading of 1.9 at 10am. Lepi says the initial infusion bag would still have been in place at this time. She says she cannot explain why that reading was low and did not do anything to cause that low blood sugar reading. She adds she did not do anything to cause the later recorded insulin levels to be high for child L. Mr Myers, had you done anything to affect insulin? Lepi replies, no. Lepi says as well as herself and Mary Griffith being the two designated nurses in that day, there were other nurses coming and going in room one, along with parents, present throughout the day. Nursing notes for one of Letby's designated babies, a high-dependency baby, are shown to the court. They include, quote, parents visiting, carrying out feeds and cares. At 1600, parents were asked to leave the nursery due to a sick baby needing treatment. Parents were understanding of this and left for the evening. Letby says this was when child M had deteriorated. She said this would be common practice to ask parents to leave in such an event. Letby adds the visiting times were 24 hours and parents would visit throughout the day. Nursing notes by Mary Griffith record for child M on April 9th, quote, At 12.15 noted that his stomach was a little distended and his work of breathing was increased. Was then sent for my break and colleague did the 12.30 feed had an aspirate of 5 mils, temperature returned to normal and baby settled. At 1600, baby went apneic and had a profound brady and desat. Full recess commenced at 1602, care handed over to SN L. Letby. Letby tells the court Mary Griffith was, at this point, not trained for the type of intensive care child M required, which was why care was handed over to her. A prescription chart shows Lucy Letby is involved with Mary Griffith in the administration of antibiotics for child M at 3.45pm. Letby says the line would also be flushed after this is administered. Letby says at the time of child M's deterioration, child L was requiring further dextrose. A chart shows Letby was involved in administering a 4.3ml 10% dextrose bolus at 3.35pm administered at 3.40pm. A 12.5% dextrose infusion is made up by nursing staff in response to ongoing low blood sugars. This begins at 3.35pm and the infusion starts at 4.30pm. The infusion start is administered by Belinda Simcock and Ashley Hudson. Letby says she and Mary Griffith had been preparing a bag for child L. She says Mary Griffith was the sterile nurse and Letby was assisting her between 3.45 and 4pm. Asked when she first became aware of a problem, Letby said the alarm went off and child M was not breathing and clearly struggling. Letby says she began initiating Neopuff straight away, but because it didn't reach, the face mask fell on the floor and Letby asked for another face mask for child M. She adds she and Mary Griffith abandoned the making up of the bag and the focus was on child M. Two other nurses started the procedure from the beginning of making up a new dextrose bag for child L. Let me said that would be standard practice to make sure staff were sure the new bag had the correct required concentrations. Let me, asked again by Mr Myers, denies doing anything to affect child L's insulin levels. She agrees child L's blood sugar levels remained low and cannot explain why that was the case. Let me says another nurse and Dr Ravi Jayram came to assist child M. She says she cannot recall any observation or discussion of discoloration on child M's skin. 
Lebby says she left later than 8pm that night as she had a lot of documentation to file at the end of her shift. A nursing note for child M by Letby is recorded as being written between 9.14 and 9.22pm on April 9th. Letby said this was after attending to the clinical needs of child M. Letby said she would write contemporaneous notes on the back of handover sheets or on paper towels to keep track during the day. The court is shown a few notes written on paper towels which were recovered from the Morrison's bag at Letby's home by police. There are also medical notes on sheets of paper. They feature notes in the resuscitation of child M. Letby says the notes were kept in the pocket of her uniform and came home with her. She says she did not have any other use for them. Also among the notes is a blood gas printout for child M. Asked to explain that note, Letby says she had put it in her pocket and taken it home. Asked by Mr Myers why she hadn't binned it, she replied, that is an error on my part. Letby confirms she continued to care quite frequently for child L and child M following their events until they were both discharged from hospital on May 3rd. Nursing and family communication notes by Letby in respect of child L and child M are shown to the court on April 16th, 17th, 24th, 25th, including when Letby had been their designated nurse. I did my best for them, Letby tells the court. Mr Myers now turns to the case of child N, a baby boy born on June 2nd, 2016 with a gestational age of 34 weeks plus 4 days. Mr Myers asks Letby how important it was for her to treat these babies. She replies, very important. I took the job extremely seriously. We want to make sure the babies go home. Mr Myers says child N was born with haemophilia. Mr Myers says the first event was on June 3rd at 1am when child N was said to be screaming or crying, desaturating and was treated with breathing support. The second event was on the morning of June 15th when child N had a profound desaturation and following from that there were attempts to intubate him and blood was found in the oropharynx. The third event was a profound desaturation at about 3pm on the same day and 3 mil of blood was aspirated from the NG tube, followed by multiple attempts to intubate child N. At 7.40pm, as the team arrived from Arrow Park, there was a further desaturation for child N. Mr Myers asks Letby about child N. Letby says she had not encountered a baby with haemophilia, and staff on the unit were, quote, quite panicked about the prospect of caring for a baby with haemophilia, as they had little or no experience either. A message let be sent to a colleague on June 2nd, quote, Everyone bit panicked by seams of things, although baby appears fine. The response, male question mark, let be, yeah. The response, factor 8 question mark, let be. Not sure, I only know what's on the handover sheet, as doctor etc all in with him doing head scan etc. Let be said at the time she did not know what factor 8 referred to. The reply to let be, quote, Lad with haemophilia when worked community with Leighton on placement. Let be. Oh, OK. I'll have to Google it later, lol. Don't know much about it. Response. Have to be careful with cannula heel pricks, etc. Give factor 8 or factor 9. I think it's dependent on which clotting factor deficiency is. Have as infusion for rest of life. Let be. Wow. Letby says her nursing colleague had more experience and it was a 50-50 chance that the mother would pass on the condition to the baby. She said it was something she had heard of but did not know the details. The shift rotor for June 2nd to 3rd is shown to the court. Lucy Letby is on duty. She says she has no memory of the shift. A note by Dr Jennifer L for child N at 0110 quote, D sat, unsettled, got upset, looked mottled, dusky, sat down to 40%, 100% O2. On my arrival, 40% O2. Screaming, poor trace on sat probe, pink, attempt to settle, crashed bleep away, on return sat 100% asleep. Let me deny having any involvement in the incident. A note by nurse Christopher Booth for child N quote, one episode whilst I was on my break, whereby infant was crying plus plus and not settling. He became dusky in colour, desaturating to 40s, responded to facial oxygen within one to two minutes. Crying subsided within 30 minutes. 
let be again denies having any involvement in this event for child N. A neonatal schedule for June 2nd to 3rd is shown to the court. She tells the court she was doing feed observations for one baby and assisting in the prescriptions for another. Neither of them are child N. The event is recorded for child N at 1am. Let B is next recorded on the schedule at 2.30am. Did you know there had been an incident with child N? Let B replies, no. Swipe data is shown that Let B entered the neonatal unit at 1.15am. The court has heard swipe data is collected when staff members enter the unit, not exit. Let B tells the court she may not have been in the unit at 1am. The allegations against you are of the most grave nature, aren't they? Letby replies, yes. In June 2016, Letby is asked about concerns outside of work. Letby said she had an active life with hobbies and friends. Instant messages are shown to the court from the morning of June 13th in relation to packing for a holiday Letby took with a friend and a nursing colleague. The discussion refers to a series of Love Island and who hosted the show. Mr Myers explains to the court who Abby Clancy is. Mr Myers asks if Letby was thinking about killing babies during that time. Letby denies that was the case. A shift pattern for Letby for June 2016 shows Letby worked long day shifts on June 8th, 10th, 11th, 13th, 14th and 15th. A doctor colleague says on June 14th, quote, Am I right in thinking you've done six long days in the last eight? No wonder you're tired. Letby says at the end of her June 14th shift for the handover of child ends care to Jennifer Jones Key, I don't recall there being any concerns at that time for child N. A nursing note by Lucy Letby for June 14th is shown to the court. It includes, quote, Repeat SBR this morning on downward trend but not yet under 50. Below treatment line but otherwise ready for home. Letby says child M was being treated for jaundice and required further phototherapy. Once that was complete, he was ready to go home. Jennifer Jones keynotes, quote, Baby very unsettled, early part of night. I noticed that just after 1am feed, baby looked very pale, mottled and veiny. Abdomen slightly bigger, seen by nurse Belinda Simcock. Advised to place baby on saturation monitor. After 30 mins, noted to be having desaturations to low 80s, no intervention required but quite frequent. Rest of observations within range. Baby looked worse this morning, 10% dextrose commenced. Let me agree child end deteriorated during the night. At 0715 quote, baby crying and drop saturations, seen by NNU nurse Lucy. Neopuff given with 100% oxygen, noted to be mottled all over body and blue in colour and cold to touch. Decision made to transfer to nursery one. At handover, baby dropped saturations again and required Neopuff. Care handed over to NNU nurse Lucy Letby. Swipe data shows Letby and a colleague entering the neonatal unit before 7.15am, in time for the 7.30 shift. Lucy recalls she went to nursery room 3 to talk to Jennifer Jones Key. The handover had not yet taken place, quote, not that I'm aware of. She said the chat happened and within minutes Child N's monitor went off and Child N appeared mottled. Letby says Jennifer Jones Key was tending to another baby. Letby says she was within the doorway and had not entered the room. Child N was in a cot by the doorway. Letby said she went straight over to him and he was a bluish colour and she called for help. Letby says Jennifer Jones Key finished what she was doing and came over to assist. A registrar doctor came over almost immediately to help. Child N recovered quickly from the initial episode but deteriorated again very quickly. Quote, his colour was not good, he was mottled and a decision was made to take and move Child N to room 1. Letby says she had been in the unit for a matter of minutes. The doctor said the decision was made to intubate child N. Letby tells the court she got the equipment ready for intubation, including routine drugs. A neonatal schedule shows Letby assisted in the administration of medication for child N at 8 to 8.06 a.m. Letby is asked if she saw blood at some point during the intubation process. Letby says she does recall that, but cannot recall at what point that was. 
The doctor's notes quote, attempted intubation times three using size zero blade, blood present at oropharynx, unable to visualize tracheal inlet, suction did not clear the view, intubation abandoned due to blood present oropharynx, trauma due to repeated attempts. Let me recorded in her notes quote, unable to intubate, fresh blood noted in mouth and yielded via suction plus plus. Letby tells the court her interpretation of the note is the blood would have appeared after the attempted intubate. A 3pm note on a fluid chart records, quote, 3 mil fresh blood as an aspirate. Letby says she did recall seeing blood in the afternoon. The note is signed by a nursing colleague of Letby. The other hourly observations are signed by Letby herself. 1 mil fresh blood is noted by Letby at 10am and 6pm. Blood plus plus is also recorded by Letby on a note, which the court hears is after 8am. Blood in mouth is recorded at 9am. Mr Myers refers to police interviews Letby had. Letby says none of what was discussed in the questioning referred to any blood seen on child N prior to the 8am intubation. She told police the airway issue was from 3 to 4 p.m. in attempts at intubation and recalls from memory seeing blood prior to 4 p.m. Let me deny saying she saw blood prior to 8 a.m. Benjamin Myers KC for Letby's defence is asking Letby questions for the third event for Child N on June 15, 2016. Lucy Letby's nursing note on that day written retrospectively includes, quote, Infant has had periods of apnea during the morning, improving by afternoon, observations stable. Approximately 1450, infant became apneic with desaturation to 44%, heart rate 90 beats per minute, fresh blood noted from mouth and 3 mils of blood aspirated from NG tube. Neopuff commenced and doctors crash called, unable to obtain secure airway. Doctors unable to insert ET tube, IGL airway inserted and infant ventilated. Letby says after this event, she has some memory of it. Quote, it was becoming increasingly chaotic. More and more staff were called out to assist. There was a sense of panic that we weren't sure how we were going to manage child N. There were loads of people called to care for him. I would say 10 to 15. Child N needed such care that he needed two people to care for him at all times. A transport team from Alderhey was called out to assist and bring Factor 8 as an emergency. Letby says Factor 8 was required for child N, but none was available on the unit. Mr Myers says it was known child N required Factor 8, and child N had been at the unit since his birth. Letby states, it then became a panic. I think baptism was offered to the parents at some point, there was a lot going on in the room. The team from Alderhey came, and there was a lot of discussion. The team had brought a lot of specialist equipment. Handover was taking place at around 7.30pm and around this time, that was when the episode happened. Doctor's notes record, quote, At 19.40, DSAT 80, down to 50, down to 40% plus associated Brady. Resus. Letby's notes written at 8.53pm recorded, quote, Medical team from AHCH arrived approximately 1900 assessed child N and decision made to attempt intubation in CLS theatre. At 1940, profound desaturation 30s with colour loss, stiff and back arching. Became bradycardic, mottled plus plus, doctors present, resus commenced, care handed over. All events took place on NNU prior to moving to CLS theatres. NWTS team arrived 2040. Letby says child N was the focus of the whole unit at that point, and there were concerns staff could not get him intubated. Quote, it was a real concern. We were all worried about him. It was something I had never experienced before. I had never seen that many people in a nursery for one baby. The concern was if we couldn't get an airway, then we would have to undergo surgery. It was frightening for his safety. Mr Myers now turns to the case of Child O, one of three triplet brothers born on June 21st, 2016, at a gestational age of 33 weeks and two days at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Child P is another one of the triplet brothers. Mr Myers recalls the events for Child O, who died at 5.47am on June 23rd. 
A post-mortem examination showed damage to the liver. Lucy Letby says prior to this, she had been abroad on holiday with her nursing colleague and a friend. A rotor of Letby shifts showed she was off on June 16th to 22nd. The rotor shows she was on long day shifts for June 23rd to 25th and June 28th to 30th. Messages are shown to the court between Letby and Jennifer Jones Key from June 22nd. Letby confirms when she is back in, adding, quote, Yep, probably be back in with a bang, lol. Asked to explain that, Letby says she would be back in a busy shift. Asked by Mr. Myers, Letby denies she was planning anything terrible. Letby said she was very available for work, as she had no commitments outside of work and lived nearby. A message from a doctor to let be quote, How was the flight? Unpacked as well. It's the only way. Washing machine on? Day has been rubbish. Lots of unnecessary stress for NNU and too much work to fit into one day. I may have overfilled the unit again. SHOs have all been fed and watered and the babies are generally okay, so maybe not as bad as I'm thinking. Let me replies, glad it's over, but flight was and airport was fine. Oh, that's not good. Back to earth with a bump for me tomorrow then. You seem to be quite good at acquiring babies to fill out empty cots. The reply to Letby states, It's a skill I've had for years. To be fair, there wasn't a social admission. Yes, you might be a bit busy. Oh, you're right. I made sure they went first. Just realised when I last ate. Oops. Letby says it was not unusual for the unit to be busy. She adds there was also discussion at this time about removing level 4 unit nurses from the neonatal unit. A shift rotor for June 23rd is shown. Letby was designated nurse for the triplets in room 2. Mr Myers asked if managing three babies in a high dependency was outside the ratio required for nurses to babies. Letby says it is. It should be one nurse to two babies in that room. In room 1, two nurses are looking after four babies. Letby says the care should be one to one, i.e. one designated nurse to one baby, and the room is full. Notes by Sophie Ellis are shown to the court for the night of June 22nd to 23rd, recording observations for child O. They include, quote, TPN stopped as reached full feeds of DEBM, donor expressed breast milk, tolerating well, 12 mils, 2 times 12. Antibiotics stopped, blood gas completed at 0532, lactate 2.3. Letby says that lactate reading is outside the normal range and she would inform a doctor about that reading. Sophie Ellis adds, quote, Abdo looks full, slightly loopy, appeared uncomfortable after feed. Letby says Rebecca Morgan was a student nurse on her first day of placement on the unit and Letby was a designated mentor. She tells the court the student nurse would be orientated onto the unit by a senior member of staff but that was not possible due to the unit being busy, so she carried out the induction process herself. On top of looking after three high-dependency babies, Letby replies, Yes, I didn't know I was going to be looking after a student until I arrived at the unit. Letby messaged a colleague, quote, It's busy, but no vents. Patients on ventilators. Anymore. I've got triplets in two, all okay, but got a student and first day two hourly feeds, etc., no time to do anything, lol, and the Von F in, but said I can show her sound, etc. The reply quote, What? That's ridiculous. When are you meant to get time to do a proper induction? Letby replies, No idea. She's nice enough, but bit hard going to start from scratch with everything when we got three babies. I don't know, and two hourly, etc. Oh, well. Letby also messaged a doctor quote, My student is glued to me. Letby's nursing notes for child O included, quote, Abdomen appeared full but soft and non-distended. Reviewed by registrar at 13.15, child O had vomited undigested milk, tachycardic and abdomen distended. Letby says two hourly observations were required for all three babies in room two and the student nurse would also be involved. A fluid balance chart shows student nurse Rebecca Morgan has completed the reading for 8.30am and had been doing the feed. For 10am and noon, the court hears Letby has signed the observation, but Rebecca Morgan has filled in the entries for feeds and aspirates. For Childo's observation chart, 
Rebecca Morgan has signed and filled in observations at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Letby says she has written in the observations for 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. Letby says the 12.30 p.m. observations have been filled in by Rebecca Morgan, but were not signed due to human error. She denies there was anything sinister in leaving out the initials on the chart. For 1.15pm, Letby recalls being outside room 2 and hearing an alarm going off. She went in and found it was Child O's alarm. She does not recall if any other nurses were in the room at that time. She recorded, quote, At 13.15, Child O had vomited undigested milk, tachycardic and abdomen distended. Letby said it was not a concerning vomit for Child O, who was not moved from room 2. The notes add, quote, Approximately 1440, Child O had a profound desaturation to 30s, followed by Brady, mottled plus plus and abdomen red and distended, transferred to nursery 1, perfusion poor. Doctors crash called at 1551 due to desaturation to 30s with Brady. Reintubated, CPR commenced 1619. Letby says for 1440, she heard a monitor alarming and went in and found it was Child O's alarm. She said she called the doctor who was next door. Quote, this was more significant as Child O needed intervention at this point. He looked different, unwell at this point. He appeared mottled. His abdomen was redder than it had been previously. Mottling is something we see quite often with babies. Mr Myers asks if Letby had introduced air into Child O or any baby in the case. Letby replies, no. The neonatal schedule for June 23, 2016 is shown to the court. The event is marked for Child O at 2.40pm. At 2.39pm, two medications are given intravenously to Child O and the records are made on the computer by Samantha O'Brien and Melanie Taylor. An infusion for Child O is made at 2.40pm by Lucy Letby and Samantha O'Brien. Letby says the order, as it appears to the court, before the event is incorrect. The infusion should be listed in sequence after the event in response to what had happened. She says she cannot comment on the 2.39pm medication as she was not there. Medicine prescription charts are shown to the court for the 2.39pm prescriptions. Swipe data shows Letby has arrived on the neonatal unit from the labour ward at 2.39pm. A doctor's notes record for the event, quote, Call to see Child O at 14.40. Desaturation, bradycardic and mottled. Bagged up and transferred to nursery 1. 10 ml sodium chloride bolus already given. Letby says the 10% saline bolus is given, as shown on an IV chart, at 2.40pm in response to Child O's deterioration. She tells the court that one minute prior she was not on the unit. Child O was transferred to room 1 and a decision was made to intubate him. Letby says she cannot recall with any clarity the events from then on. A note from Dr Breer is shown to the court at 6pm, quote, Assisted with initial intubation, small discoloured purpuric rash on right side chest wall, good perfusion. Letby says this is not something she had observed or was identified to her at any point. Letby says she could not recall the next few hours as events for child O merged into one. She recalls CPR taking place and there being two doctors and two nurses present. She does not recall taking part in CPR. The court is shown there were two episodes of CPR at 4.19 and 5.16 p.m. Let me recall a drain being inserted during resuscitation. Asked about what the atmosphere is like when a baby dies on the unit, Let me tells the court, quote, It's completely flat. There is a complete change in atmosphere. To me personally, it's devastating. You want to save every baby you can in your care. You're not supposed to watch a baby die. Mr Myers says a post-mortem examination identified an injury on the liver. He asks if Letby knows how that happened. Letby replies, no. Text messages between Letby and a doctor from June 30th to July 1st, 2016 are shown to the court concerning the liver injury. Letby recalls a colleague being very upset and was crying at what had happened. The doctor had messaged, quote, I'm not sure where the information has come from. It seems that on the SHO grapevine, somebody at LWH has said that one of the triplets was found to have a ruptured liver. 
Colleague was upset that this may have been caused by chest compressions. Letby replies, oh no, that's awful. No wonder she's upset. Were you able to reassure her? The doctor replied, we spent 20 mins in a cubicle going over everything. The CPR was all on the fifth rib space between the nipples. The duoderm on child O was high. If there was anything, it would have been due to fluid volume causing liver distension. I'm not sure I believe it. It was a coroner's PM. It usually takes weeks to get any report. Letby replies, It seems like a bit of a rumour mill has gone into overdrive. The boys were only returned today. Can't see how info would be out that quick. Doctor replies, No, me neither. Letby responds, Not nice for a colleague though. Can see how it would play on her mind. Doctor replies, This has come at the end of a seven day run for her. Not a good time. Letby responds, No. It's good that she felt able to tell you though. Mr Myers is now turning to the case of child P. Mr Myers says there was quote mild abdominal distension recorded in child P's clinical notes at 6pm on June 23rd with milk and air aspirates recorded overnight. At around 9.40am on June 24th child P had desaturation, distended abdomen and mottling. At 12.28pm there was a further desaturation and bradycardia. Around that time, a pneumothorax was identified on the chest x-ray. At 3.14pm, child P collapsed and later died at 4pm. A shift rotor for June 23rd is re-shown to the court. Let B was designated baby for child O and P and one other baby in room 2. Let B says the focus was on child O that afternoon and does not recall anything significant for child P at that time. Her nursing notes from June 23rd quote, Nursed in an incubator, observations within normal range. Continues with two hourly feeds, minimal aspirates obtained. Abdomen appears full, but soft and non-distended. Difficulty obtained IV access, secured after numerous attempts. Letby says there was nothing concerning regarding child P at this time. A doctor's notes that afternoon for child P records, quote, Abdomen full, mildly distended. Letby tells the court there was nothing unusual about that. An abdominal x-ray for child P is taken at 8.09pm after Letby had stopped giving care for child P. Letby tells the court she had stopped at 2pm that day officially as her care was focused on child O that afternoon and care of child P was handed over. The x-ray report included, quote, gas-filled bowel loops throughout the abdomen. Letby says student nurse Rebecca Morgan was still involved in the care of child P. An observation chart for child P for June 23rd is shown. Letby says she signed at 8am and co-signed at 10am with the observations filled in by the student nurse Rebecca Morgan. The court hears Rebecca Morgan signed and filled in observations for noon, 2pm, 4pm and 6pm. Sophie Ellis records observations from 8pm onwards. The feeding chart is shown for June 23rd. Letby says she has co-signed at 8am, 10am, noon, 2pm and 4pm, while Rebecca Morgan has signed and completed the entries. Trace aspirates are recorded for child P throughout the day, other than a small amount of vomit at noon. Letby says other nurses and Rebecca Morgan were looking after child P by 6pm. Letby says after the overnight shift, Sophie Ellis said she was quite concerned for child P due to the abdomen exam and following the events for brother child O and child P, so was placed nil by mouth as a precaution. Nursing notes by Sophie Ellis on June 23rd, 24th included, quote, Observations have been within limits. Did have one DSAT into 80s and one Brady into high 90s. Self-corrected, no intervention required. Does at times have a low-lying HR between high 90s and 110. SHO aware. Feeding 14 mil part digested milk aspirate gained at 20 hundred feed. Nurse in charge informed. Continued with feed. Midnight feed 20 mil part digested milk aspirate obtained. Abdo is full but soft. Abdo has been soft and non-distended. 25 mil of air aspirated. NGT placed on free drainage. Lebby says the 40 mil aspirate at 20 hundred hours was a change following trace aspirates. A 20 mil aspirate was taken and discarded at midnight. Letby says that was a sign the baby was not digesting the milk and that was a decline in the baby's health. 
Leppy says she would have expected a stomach for Child P to be empty at that point. Child P from midnight onwards was nil by mouth and was put on 10% dextrose fluids. 25 mils of air was aspirated from Child P at 4am. Let be, quote, that is a very large volume of air. Mr Myers, should it be there? Let be replies, no. 5 mil of air and 2 mil of milk is aspirated at 7am. Letby tells the court that is something you would not expect to find at that time for a baby nil by mouth, and said there had been a noticeable decline in child P's health. The day shift for June 24th is shown to the court. Student nurse Rebecca Morgan is on the rotor. Letby is the designated nurse for a baby in room 2. The other surviving triplet is also in room 2 with designated nurse Christopher Booth. Letby said she was asked to continue looking after child P, Asked for her opinion on that by Mr Myers, Letby said, I felt that was the right thing to do, for the parents to have that continuity. Letby recalls, for the morning of June 24th, quote, I was conducting my safety checks, noticed Chalpy's abdomen was quite loopy. You could see the stomach had changed, was raised. I spoke to the nurse in charge about this and wait for the doctors to review. Very soon after the doctors reviewed Chalpy, Chalpy had an apnea that needed attention. Letby says herself, Dr Anthony Coe and Rebecca Morgan were in the room at the time of the deterioration. Child P was apneic. I went out to call for help. Other doctors were in room 1 as part of their ward round and came to assist. Child P stayed in room 2. Letby states, at this point room 1 was busy and it was felt safer to keep him in room 2. Letby's nursing note for June 24th, written at 9.18pm and finished at 10pm, is shown to the court. It includes, quote, Child P nursed in an incubator, abdomen full, loops visible, soft to touch. Reg co-arrived to carry out ward round. Child P had apnea, brady, DSAT with mottled appearance, requiring facial oxygen and neopuff for approximately one minute. Abdomen becoming distended shortly after acute deterioration. Lebby says Child P was intubated and seemed stable at this point. Child P had a further desaturation at 11.30am. He was given adrenaline and he was paralysed with a drug to aid ventilation. Lebby says there was no issue with a tube dislodging or one recorded in the notes. She recorded a pneumothorax which had been identified in Child P after the collapse. Asked outside of the notes to recall Child P the rest of June 24th, she said, quote, I just remember there being a general decline throughout the rest of the shift. Let be said she gave a lot of medication to Child P. She said for her nursing notes written at the end of the day, notes were written contemporaneously on a piece of paper. Let be does not recall a distinct change in colour for Child P that afternoon. Quote, there was an increasing sense of anxiety on the unit and a huge sense of relief when the transport team did arrive from Arrow Park, a tertiary centre. Five Countess staff were there throughout the day and one of the doctors frequently left the building to have a cigarette, which the court hears was something they would normally do. Child P's medical needs were beyond our level of care, let be said. She tells the court that potentially she may have said words to the effect of he's not leaving here alive, is he? Letby says she was present when Child P died. She says support was given afterwards to the family. She remembers dressing Child O and Child P. Asked about the atmosphere in the unit after the second triplet died, Letby says, quote, It was completely flat atmosphere. Everybody was shocked, devastated. The whole unit was just flat, generally. It wasn't the usual positive atmosphere we would normally have. I was really upset two days in a row. To imagine what the parents had gone through, it was harrowing. The family communication note for Child P by Letby is written retrospectively at 10pm. Quote, I have dressed Child P at their request and taken photos of Child O and Child P together. Support given to parents and extended family. Time spent on Lavender Suite as a family. Lebby says the note was written so late as she had gone to A&E herself for a needle stick injury. One of the needles for child P had pricked her finger, the court hears. Lebby says there was a pathway she had to follow and she had to take boosters and vaccinations. She said she was unwell, quote, I had fainted. She said from the stress of the day she hadn't eaten. 
the enormity of the past two days had taken its toll. Letby confirms she completed her notes after her A&E visit for child P. Letby says a doctor she had been messaging had offered her a lift home, having been aware she had gone to A&E and would be otherwise walking home alone at night. The doctor gave her a lift and Letby tells the court he then drove home. The court is shown handover sheets for June 25, 2016, recovered from Letby's home by police in 2018. Asked to explain why this and ones for June 23rd, 24th were found at her home, she said, quote, They have come home in my uniform and I have not done anything with them. The handover notes also include other babies Letby was the designated nurse for. A message from Letby to a doctor on June 23rd said, quote, I lost my handover sheet, found it in the donor milk fridge. Clearly, I should still be in Ibiza. Letby is asked to explain a search for the surname of Child O and Child P on June 23, 2017. Letby said the date was the anniversary, quote, They were on my mind. It was such a harrowing experience seeing the parents lose those two children. In two days running, you don't forget something like that. This note is shown to the court. The note the court hears is a reference to the anniversary of Child O and Child P's death. Let me add, her writing also was how she felt at the time of writing the note. Mr Myers will now be asking Lucy Letby questions in the case of Child Q, the final of the 17 babies in the trial. Child Q, a baby boy, was born on June 22, 2016. Child Q was born at 31 weeks and 3 days gestation at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Mr Myers tells the court there was one event for Child Q on the morning of June 25th. Vomiting, desaturation, bradycardia, with air plus plus aspirated from the NG tube. A doctor gave a diagnosis of probable NEC the following day, and Child Q was transferred to Alderhey on June 27th, returning to the Countess of Chester Hospital the following day. A handover sheet for June 28th, 2016 is shown to the court, in which Lucy Letby is designated nurse for three babies, not Child Q that day in room three. Letby said she was, quote, drained and emotionally exhausted by June 25th following the events for Child O and Child P. A day shift for June 25th is shown. Rebecca Morgan is on duty as a student nurse. Letby tells the court she was no longer the mentor as she didn't have the time, so Miss Morgan was overseen by other nurses. Letby is the designated nurse for Child Q in room 2 and a baby in room 1. Letby tells the court you'd have to split yourself between the nurseries when given designated care for two babies in two different nursery rooms. Nursing notes for June 24th to 25th, quote, Child Q self-ventilating in air, feet pink and warm, new lipid syringe put up overnight having trophic feeds of donor EBM 0.5 mils to hourly due to moderate aspirates. Abdomen full but soft. Letby says the trophic feeds are to get a baby's digestive system going. The aspirates indicated child Q was not ready to tolerate larger feeds yet. A feeding chart for June 23rd is shown to the court for child Q. A 2 mil milky aspirate is recorded at 2030. At this point, the court hears, Child Q had received a total of 3.5 mils of milk. Let me said, you would hope the aspirates would be decreasing throughout this time. A 3 mil aspirate is recorded at 3am on June 24th. Let me says, it wouldn't be of great concern, but ideally we would want the aspirate to be the least possible. At the time of the handover on the morning of June 25th, Let me said she noticed from the observation chart he was on the cold side, and she would want him reviewed by a doctor before the 9am feed. Letby said she was concerned about the temperature. Child Q was on the borderline of being too cold on the chart, and the incubator temperature was increased from 30.2C to 32C throughout the day. The temperature remained low, which Letby said was a concern. Letby said she would not feed Child Q until the doctors had reviewed him at 9am. Letby said she was also caring for an intensive care baby in room 1. She said for cares to be given in room 1, she would have to ensure a nurse remained present in room 2. She informed two nurses when she had to go into room 1. 
One nurse was sat at the nursing station and the doctors were starting their ward rounds at around 9am. Let me said she went into room 1 just after 9am and does not recall how the room 1 baby was doing. A neonatal schedule for June 25th is shown to the court. Let B is recorded as making observations at 9am for child Q. Let B assists a nurse in room 1 for medication at 9.04am. Let B says she was in room 1 for a few minutes and could hear something going on outside the nursery. Quote, I went out through the door and I could see down the corridor. Let B went to child Q's cot side where there were two nurses who were present. Let be heard from a colleague child Q had vomited a mucousy vomit. He had stopped and recovered by the time Let B arrived. Let B's notes quote 0800 observations as charted. Temperature low, incubator increased times 2. Tachycardic, active and alert, abdomen soft and non distended. 0910. Child Q attended by SN Lapalinen. He had vomited clear fluid nasally and from mouth. Desaturation and bradycardia, mottled plus plus. Neopuff and suction applied. Reg attended, air plus plus aspirated from NG tube. Let me says this was all relayed to her and not from her observation. Nurse Mina Lapalinen wrote, quote, Baby found to be very mucousy, clear mucus from nasopharynx, oropharynx removed. Clear fluid plus plus plus, O2 via Neopuff. Doctor emergency to attend, NGT used to aspirate stomach by nurse Lucy Letby. Letby confirms the description of the type of fluid was the only one she heard. She did not administer the Neopuff breathing support. Letby confirms she continued to care for child Q after he was transferred to room 1. Mr Myers asks, in the context of the trial and every day at the hospital, whether this had been a significant event. Letby replies, this wasn't a significant event. This is something we deal with on a routine basis. Not that it's not important. He needed minimal intervention. Mr Myers. And in the course of the day, did child Q have any further collapse? Let me replies, no. Let B's notes add, respiratory rate declining and intermittent pauses in breathing. Blood gas stable but on downward trend and child Q appearing tired. Oxygen requirements developing. Discussed with consultant Gibbs and decision made to electively intubate. Uneventful intubation, care handed over. Lebby says other than child Q requiring CPAP, there were no other outstanding issues for him. A nursing note by Lucy Lebby for child Q is shown for June 29th and June 30th. Lebby confirms she was child Q's designated nurse for those days. She does not recall outside of the notes being the designated nurse for child Q on those days. Messages are shown between Let B and a doctor. Quote, do I need to be worried about what Dr Gibbs was asking? Let B said she had became aware during the shift on who was present in the nursery when child Q had his episode. She said she was worried she would be blamed for leaving him alone in the nursery. Let B messaged, I walked into equipment room. He was asking Mary who was present in the room and how quickly someone had gone to him as I wasn't in the room. He asked who was there. I said I had popped out of the room, but Mary was in the room and Mina at the desk. The reply quote, all he was doing was checking that there wasn't a delay and that the room had been left empty. Was he HDU level because of UVC? There's nothing to worry about. Let me replies, okay, was worried because I wasn't with him at the time, but Mary was in the room and Mina outside. I had B in room 1. ITU because of UVC. Let B tells the court child Q had not been left unattended, but felt she may have been accused of leaving him unattended and or that she should not have left room 2. Let B did not work on the unit after June 30th, 2016. Let B says for the annual leave on July 4th to 6th, 2016, she was on a family holiday. She recalls the day before she was due to go back to work. She received the news she was going to a meeting with Irian Powell. She would not be going back to the unit for the time being, the court hears. Further messages between Letby and the doctor are shown to the court. Quote, Did you manage some sleep? Back on NNU. They want to send Child Q back as a medical NEC. Not sure if the unit is open for transfers. Few managers, medical director around this morning. Letby replies, yeah, got some sleep. Did you? Good news about both. 
Hope they don't rush child Q back. Letby tells the court other babies have been brought back to the Countess too soon, including child I and child G. The doctor replies, got about three hours. Coffee is good. It was odd. He's only been there for 14 hours. I think this is a sign of how AH is going to be. They are so short of beds they can only accommodate emergency patients. It's not good holistic care, and it's rubbish for the parents. Letby says they refers to Alderhay, and Child Q was no longer an emergency baby, so was sent back. Letby's messages between herself and a nursing colleague are shown for June 27th. Letby quote, I reckon there's going to be big meetings etc about what's gone on with unit being closed, lack of staff etc. Letby tells the court the unit being closed was closed to new arrivals. Letby had messaged quote, We're way over capacity and it's skill mix too. Letby tells the court it was an ongoing issue. Later that day, Letby messaged her quote, E just phoned telling me to do days this week and not go in tonight as trying to protect me. The response quote, What's that mean? Letby, I don't know. Asked if there was a problem and she said no, just trying to protect me has had a difficult run just before holidays. Less people on nights etc and we can have a chat tomorrow. But I'm worried I'm in trouble or something. Let me said it seemed an unusual thing to do. The reply, don't worry, how can you be in trouble? You haven't done anything wrong. Just very unfortunate. Let me replies, I know, but worrying in case they think I've missed something or whatever. Why leave it till now to ring? Let me says she thought she might have overlooked something. She tells the court getting things right in her work, quote, was my life job. Let me is asked why a Datix report is on her phone. Letby said this was something she needed to do for child O and child P. Letby says she cannot recall if she ever did these tasks. The email from Yvonne Griffiths on July 15th is shown to the court, referring to Letby's redeployment to an office-based role in the hospital. Letby said she wasn't happy about the move and it had been imposed on her. She said she was aware that by this time, the Countess neonatal unit had been redesignated to a level 1 unit. Letby's message on August 8th to a nursing colleague, quote, Tony phoned, he's going to speak to Karen and insist on the review being no later than first week of September, but said he definitely wouldn't advise pushing to get back on the unit until it's taken place. Asked about social things and he said, it's up to me, but he wouldn't advise speaking with anyone in case any of them are involved with the review process. Thinks I should keep head down and ride it out and can take further once over. Feel a bit like I'm being shoved in a corner and forgotten by the trust. It's my life and career. He's not being given any information about the evidence he asked for, which is good. He's not sure what the external people are going to look at in relation to me, but we are in the process now, so have to ride it out. The reply states, OK, well, just have to take his advice then, I suppose. Letby replies, I still can't believe this has happened. It's making me feel like I should hide away by saying not speak to anyone and going on for months, etc. I haven't done anything wrong. Letby said she was expected to lie about things going on, that she was happy to be redeployed elsewhere. After the email was sent about secondments, Letby said, quote, Oh my God, she sent email about secondments. The reply was three laughing emojis. Email is on fire. Letby replies, bloody hell, fuming. I'm in the email and it makes it sound like my choice. The court hears Letby had filed a grievance procedure against the hospital. Letby tells the court that by this point, quote, I didn't know what to do. It was having a massive impact on all aspects of my life. It was emotionally very difficult. I was lonely. I didn't know what was going on. Some of Letby's notes are shown to the court. Letby says she would not have written these all at once. The writing is at various angles. When asked about it, quote, that is what I do. I write things down. It includes Letby's signature, quote, doodling. Letby says, she couldn't say if it was at the time she was being blamed. There are repeated, quote, everything is manageable, written six times. A lady in occupational department had said that to Letby, which resonated with her. The love hearts are, quote, just doodling. Various names, including a doctor, Karen Reese, director of nursing, and Mina. Quote, they were people that were important to me at the time. They were the main people I could talk to. Also written is... I can't do this anymore. Letby said she was fighting for my life, my job. Also written is help me and please help. Letby says at this point I had lost everything. I just wanted someone to help me. 
I couldn't understand how all of this was happening to me. Another sheet is shown to the court. It has densely packed handwriting at different angles. The allegations were, let be said, beyond comprehension. Mr Myers, could you cope with it? Let be replies, no. A note also reads, I really can't do this anymore. I just want to be as it was. I want to be happy in the job that I loved. Really, I don't belong anywhere. I am a problem to those who know me. The note adds, quote, Please help me, doctor. Love me. Please help me, doctor. You are my best friend, doctor. Becoming tearful, let be denies causing harm or there is any truth in her intending to kill babies in administering insulin. I only ever did my best. That concludes Mr Myers' questions.